switch you switch it on over to you so you can get started with the presentation. Sounds good. And I just started the recording on my side. And so we should okay. be good to go. Hey, guys, I appreciate you guys joining me for uh, a marathon of Power BI. And Erica, thank you for getting those poll questions ahead of time. That uh, certainly helps quite a bit when it comes to uh, digging into what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to be digging a little bit beyond some of the basics. So many of you, uh, let me kind of go back through some of the questions that Erica asked earlier. A lot of you are still in the beginner phases of Power BI. So we had 58% of you uh, that are attending that actually answered the question, are beginners in Power BI? And good news, even though this is an advanced session today, we're going to kind of go at a pace where you'll be able to uh, really dig in deep with me. And I'll also let you know and, and uh, inform you that we've actually done a three-hour Power BI intro takeover, which was another three-hour virtual workshop like this, uh, last year. Uh, so you can look on our website. If you go to pragmaticworks.com and you look for our free training, you'll be able to find where we've done the same three-hour type topic, but from an introductory perspective. So if that's for, if that's what you're looking for, we certainly have that as well. Uh, but I, I think you'll get a lot out of today as well. I also asked, I had Erica ask a couple other questions that are really relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Things like, have you ever used the R scripting language? That might have felt like an odd question for you, but it's actually quite relevant for what we're going to be talking about today. And the majority of you have never used it before. So you're going to actually get a taste of what R can do and how R can be integrated into Power BI as we go through our topic today. So I think you'll find out there's a lot of things you can do, and frankly, you don't even have to be an expert in R. There's a lot of resources out there that will really give you guidance and give you some kind of cheats, I guess, to be able to jumpstart your R usage. And I'm going to show you some really creative ways you can use R. Uh, we also asked uh, around your uh, kind of struggles around complex DAX. So if that's something that you're struggling with, and we actually had a large 68% of you said that they were struggling with, with DAX, or your user base is struggling with DAX. And um, so we're going to have a little bit of DAX, but I do want to also let you know, you might have seen kind of scrolling around on the slides earlier that Erica had a, a future webinar coming up called Advanced DAX. Uh, as a webinar that we're going to have coming up later this month. So there's a lot of things that we're doing to try to help you guys out. Hopefully you guys enjoy not only uh, today's session, but some of the ones that we have coming up. So real quickly, if you're not really familiar with who I am, my name is Devin Knight. Uh, I'm the training director here at Pragmatic Works. So anything having to do with our, our paid training that we do, uh, it goes through me in some form or fashion. So we're, we're kind of building out a, a big training platform with a lot of things like Power BI training, DAX training, all sorts of stuff to, to help you guys out. We're, we're building a lot to that. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and I've written some books around SQL Server in the past, and I run a local user group here in Jacksonville, Florida, which is usually a very shiny, uh, sunshiny place, is uh, very rainy and nasty today, uh, but that's okay, we could use it. I also blog at a website called devonnightsql.com. I recommend you go there for this purpose. I'm going to have a lot of resources out there. I blog at minimum once a week on a Power BI topic, typically around Power BI custom visuals. So I recommend you take a look at my website. It's just devonnightsql.com, and you'll be able to find a lot of new Power BI content that may be new to you. All right, so our plan for today is this. I'm, I'm going to try and be very minimalistic when it comes to slides because I have a lot of demos that I want to get through with you. I actually have 17 independent demos that I've worked on for this session, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. But here's really what we're going to be covering from a high level in today's session. We're going to talk about how do we solve some more complex problems when it comes to Power BI. So how do we solve things like data import problems that really go beyond the basics of connecting the data sources, bringing it in, and then visualizing it. How do we solve some of those more complex problems when I have data that's not in perfect shape or needs to be cleansed? And so we're going to talk about some scenarios around that and some things that you can do on your side to be able to fix bad data as it comes in. We're also going to talk through some data modeling problems. So as we pull our data into Power BI and, and bring it and store it into a Power BI data model, how, what are some things that we can do to enhance what we do there? So things like writing DAX queries. We'll talk a little bit of DAX because I know we're going to have an advanced DAX session later. I'm not going to dig too deep into DAX today. But we're going to talk about things like row-level security that you can enable and some uh, little features like uh, Q&A and synonyms that you can enable to make uh, your Power BI service functionality work even better. Finally, we're going to wrap up with quite a bit on data visualizations. Usually when I do this session, data visualizations ends up being the last, and it is today as well. And so because of that, 
I don't have as much time to cover things in that, but I really, really wanted to save some time for data visualization. So I have a lot of data visualization demos. If you're more of a, a data visualization geek like me and you like to learn all about new and, and interesting ways to visualize data, uh, hang around for the last hour. That's where we're going to spend a lot of time uh, and a lot of demos on visualizing data. So this is at, at its core what we're going to be covering today at a high level. Uh, but let's go ahead and dig in deep into it because, like I said, I have a lot to show you today. We have 17 independent demos. So the first thing that we're going to talk about, though, is you know what kind of complex data problems do you have? So when it comes to importing data, what are some of the things that really cause issues? Uh, it may be a matter of the type of data that you're importing. You may not think it has a, connect to, uh, a connectivity to Power BI, which oftentimes we find out is not true. There's a lot of uh, connectors built into Power BI, while they might not be specifically for that uh, data source that you're using. You can generally use things like ODBC connectors to get into the data sources that you need. Uh, maybe it's that you're dealing with you know, sp especially bad form data. The data in itself is not formed in a way that's easy to produce and build BI reports. And so that's what we're going to look at through this first section in our first hour today. Remember, this is a three-hour session, and by the way, it is recorded. That's our most frequently asked question. This is recorded. You will be able to watch it later, but of course, uh, make, sure, make sure you can get as much of it in today as you can. It's always difficult to come back to things later. But one of the first things that we're going to look at here around data import problems is dealing with unusual data sources. So say, for example, you're given data from a vendor system of some kind. Okay, maybe you get data from the government instead. So <laughs> I, I like, I'm watching the questions, by the way. I won't be able to answer them all up front, but I like that the uh, there's no solution to the, to the maze somebody caught. Um, but maybe you're dealing with complex data sources that aren't really formed in a way that you can build BI and data visualizations on top of it because you're given those visuals or you're given that data in a format that's already considered a report. And so one of the first things that we're going to look at is actually the matter of how you can take what is already a report and turn it into a data source. Okay, and so that's one of the first things that we're going to look at. And we're going to look at two different examples when it comes to that. One that's kind of a simple one, and then one we're going to go much more complex that's going to take us more time to work on. We're also going to talk about how you can run queries more efficiently in Power BI. So we're always curious about how do we performance tune what we're doing? How do we make sure that we're doing, thing the most, doing things in the most efficient manner possible? And so that's why what we're going to look at in the first hour of today's session is how we can deal with more, efficient, more efficiently running queries and what can we do to validate that our queries are running as efficient as possible. Uh, and then finally, if we have some time, I, I cut a little bit from our beginning section because I, I did ask that question about R, and I have actually integrated in some R examples in here about how we can integrate and take from that R query language and make it so that we can extend what's possible inside of Power BI, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Our first thing that we're going to talk about, like I said a moment ago, is turning data that's really a report into a data source, okay? And so what you're looking at here on my screen is a view of a report, okay? And this is kind of a tabular view of a report where we're able to see, it's almost like a matrix here, we're able to see column headers where I have the name, the position, the start date, and salary. And then going down on rows, we have some subtotals that look to and appear to be at the city level, where you can see here I have London and all of my salaries aggregated for London up, and I have New York and all of my salaries aggregated for New York up. And a lot of times what we'll see whenever we have something like this and we'll think, man, this is how am I going to take this data and actually make it useful from a BI perspective? And initially that might seem like a difficult thing, but what we're going to do is actually show you how you can fix this and turn it into something that more looks like this, where it's a, a data set that's more appropriate for BI, where we actually take those subtotals we have of cities and make them into their own value or their own column here at the very end. So it's not uh, terribly difficult to do, but in case you've never done it before, that's what we're going to be doing here. And here's our, uh, what our data looks like. Let me actually pull up our data source here so you can see an example of what it looks like before we get started here. It's opening on my other screen here. It's Excel. Here we go. So this is an example of what the data looks like that we're going to be working with. Again, it has subtotals for, and the, by the way, the subtotals could be at the bottom or the top. In this case, they're at the top. But we have subtotals for all of our individuals' uh, salaries rolled up to the city level. And you can see that all the way down here we have for London, New York, so on and so forth, San Francisco. And we want to be able to take this value here and make it into its own row our own column, I should say. And the reason for that is if we wanted to be able to take this information now and know uh, what city that uh, Sonia works in, 
it's going to be really difficult to do that with the way that the data is formed right now. Now, if I can take this value here and duplicate it all the way down, then we're in business. Then we can start to use this information inside of a new report as opposed to the way it's format, formatted now. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out, and we're going to launch Power BI Desktop. And like I said, I'm going to be pretty light on slides. I'm going to have a ton of demonstrations for you guys today, though. So I hope you guys like demos and not slides, because I'm not doing a lot of slides today. Uh, and we'll, as we launch our Power BI instance here, let me bring it over on the right screen. Uh, but as we do that, we're going to be working through a ton of different examples. I think you guys will see a lot of interesting things that you can do in Power BI that maybe you didn't realize you could do. So, uh, by the way, there is actually an update to Power BI that came out yesterday. So, if you're one of those uh, individuals that maybe downloaded Power BI a month or multiple months ago, Power BI is updated very frequently. In fact, like I said, it was just updated yesterday. Uh, so, newsflash, if you didn't already see that, you can go download it yourself if you go to powerbi.com and you'll be able to get the updated version of the tool. And I'm going to actually show you some of the new features that were just released yesterday as we go through our demonstrations today. Now this particular first demo that we're going to do doesn't have any of those new features, but you'll see them as we go through our examples today. All right, so our first step in this demonstration is we're going to go get some of our data from that Excel workbook that I just showed you a moment ago. So to get started, for those of you that are beginners, which was a large portion of our audience today, to get started with Power BI in, uh, to connect to your data, you're always going to start by going up to this Get Data section here. So up in the section here, this top ribbon where you see Get Data, that's your starting point of where you're going to be pulling in data. So I'll select Get Data, and you can either hit the drop down here, or you can click the button, the uh, Get Data button on the top end, and that'll launch the editor where you can actually see all the data sources that are available to you. Now one thing I'll point out to you, I mentioned there was a Power BI release that came out yesterday. One of the really cool new features that came out yesterday is a new data source called Power BI Service. Just briefly, I'll mention what this is. I'll talk, kind of talk to some of the new stuff as we go through our demonstrations. What the Power BI Service Connector allows you to do is co to connect to a data source that's already been published to Power BI. So let's say, for example, you're the data consumer. You're not really a Power BI developer. You're more the consumer of the, 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 the results. And maybe you'll create some reports, but you're really not creating the queries that connect to the data. If that's the case, you as the data consumer can still build reports using the Power BI Desktop now by connecting using this Power BI service. And here's how it works very briefly here. If I hit Power BI service, you'll see it's connecting into my account. You do have to sign in. And it's showing me all of the data sources are all of the connectors that I have available to me. And then I can go drill into any one of these. Let's say, for example, this past session one, and I can select any one of the data sources I have here. And I can now build reports inside of the Power BI desktop connected into a data source that lives on the Power BI service or powerbi.com. That's really neat. That's a new feature that just came out yesterday. The one thing I'll note with that is the data sources are exclusively read-only, meaning that you can't add any kind of um, uh, calculations. It's purely just read-only where you can build reports on top of it. In fact, if you were to connect to this now, the data and relationship view go away. It's just the report view whenever you do that. So keep that in mind, but it's a nice new feature that was just added yesterday. Now for this first example that we're focused in on, we're going to be pulling in some data from Excel. So I'm going to go select Excel from my list here. And the data source that I'm going to have in here is going to be this file with groupings. That's the file we looked at here just a few moments ago. So I'm going to select file with groupings and hit open. Now, once I select open, it's going to go connect and bring this data into my navigator pane that we're looking at now. And in this case, I only have one spreadsheet in this workbook. So we'll select the one here called vendor report. And you can see it looks just like what we saw when I opened the file a few moments ago. And I will select edit. All right, now when I launch open the query editor, this is going to bring me into an area where I can actually start to manipulate the data. So a couple of the things that we'll want to do in here is you really want to stop for a moment and almost stop yourself and think logically through what it is you're trying to do here. There's, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can take this. Just like any other technical query language, there's a lot of ways you, you can skin a cat, right? You can solve the problem many different ways. And so you have to kind of think through really first before you start clicking around is what is the problem that you're trying to solve? In this case, what the problem is I'm trying to solve is I want to take this value and this value, London and Edinburgh, and I want to make them into their own column that duplicate all the way down so that I can see uh, that uh, Jenna and Haley and all these individuals live in London and all these individuals live in this city. And I want to be able to see that as a value next to it inside the city, inside a new column. So thinking through that, what it might make sense to do is actually take this value the name column, 
And whenever there is a null, let's say null position or null age or null start date, whenever this value is null, I want to take this value and put it into its own column. And that can be our starting point. Start thinking logically through how you would solve the problem first and then start going through the clicks to do it. Now there's a uh, one, really one way to solve this one uh, and that's by going over to the top ribbon. So if I go up to the top ribbon here and I can select uh, transform. Underneath the trans, I'm sorry, excuse me, the add column section here. Underneath add column, I meant to say, there's several different ways that you can add columns. And one of the new ways you have here is columns from example. I'm gonna show you how that works a little bit later. This is what was just released yesterday as well. Very cool feature, but I'll, I'll show you that in a later example. But there's uh, what we want to do is we want to conditionally bring this value over to the last section here. And you might think that you can do that through a conditional column, but you actually can't. And here's why you can't use conditional column for this. If I were to try and use conditional column for this problem we're trying to solve, I would say that I want to bring back, here's how conditional column works. I would say that I want to create a new column called city. And if the position column is equal to null, then I want to return back the name column. But unfortunately here you'll notice the output can't return back another column here. There's nothing here that you can tell it I won't actually want to select another column as the output. So because of that, what you actually need to do instead is cancel this, and you're going to select to create a custom column right here. So not a conditional column, but a custom column. And what we'll do is we'll write a little bit of an M query. So we're going to be using the M query language here to be able to generate a new column. And it's a basic little if statement. It's, you know, the conditional uh, column there is pretty close to being able to solve this problem outside of that last thing I showed you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to type in if, and I'll say if the position is null, then return back name, okay, else return back city. I'm sorry, return back, uh, I think I did that wrong. If the position is null, then return back name else no, there we go. All right, so that's perfect. So we're going to say, basically what we're saying is if this position, if this value is null, return back this value. Otherwise, return back a list of nulls. So if I hit OK on this, it's going to create a brand new column for me, a custom column. I should have renamed it. And I can, of course, rename that now here as well. I can call it city. But now it's created a new column for me here that has just the city value and nothing else. Now that's great and all, but I really need that city value to appear next to each individual. And that's where you have another transform that comes in handy called fill down. So what I'll do is I'll select the city column. I'll go up to the transform ribbon up in the very top here. So you'll go find the, the, the top ribbon and find transform. And underneath the transform ribbon, I'm going to use this option here called fill down. And by using the fill down option, what it's going to do is it's going to duplicate that value all the way down until it finds something to replace it with. And as soon as it finds something to replace it with, it swaps it out with the new value and it continues that new value all the way down. That's how fill down works. Pretty handy little transform. And in, th in, case, in this case, it actually did exactly what I needed it to. So now with that, I really don't need this row here. I don't need row number one, row number 11. I don't need that row anymore. So what I can do is I can simply filter those rows out by going to pos the position column again and telling it to get rid of nulls and hit OK. So here I have a, a fine data set now that we can use and take this now into Power BI and be able to visualize it. Now one thing to note here is you'll note that I use the null value to filter out positions, but I'm also using the null value in the conditional statement that I wrote a few moments ago. And what's good to know about how the query editor works and how the M query language works is it's all serial. Nothing's running in parallel is what I mean by that. So I can actually both use that null column in my conditional statement, and then I can also filter out all the null, null rows as long as I'm doing it in, the, in, a, in a certain sequence. And that certain sequence is something that you'll see on the right-hand side here. On the right-hand side, you'll see this applied step section, and I have a certain sequence of where I've actually accomplished these items. So for example, I did this add column where I told it I wanted to use the null value to be able to um, determine what my city name was and then I used the fill down to fill, fill the rest of the cities down. And, but then I filtered out that same null that we used up here. And you can do that because it works in a sequence here. You don't necessarily have to have everything um, uh, run in parallel. In fact, it doesn't run in parallel. All right, so now that I have this data set, I'll go ahead and hit close and apply. If I go back up to the top query editor, hit close and apply. All right. And then, while well, that I'm inside of the report view, I can start to build a quick little report here. So maybe what I want to do, and by the way, we'll talk about some custom visuals at some point today as we go through this three-hour session. But I'm going to import a custom visual here to just kind of give you a peek at how that works really early on here. 
In the visualization section, I can start to visualize this data, but one, and you have a set of standard visuals that are provided to you. But you can also import custom visuals. And I'm going to show you later how to do that, but I've already downloaded this one for the purposes of this demo. So I'm going to import a custom visual from a file. And it gives you a little warning here. That's okay. And I'm going to find my custom visual called Sunburst for this one. And we're going to bring into the Sunburst. I'm going to go ahead and select the Sunburst to put it on my visualization pane here. And what I'd like to do is I want to see in here the city and the position. And I'd like to also bring in salaries. All right, so here's how Sunburst works. Basically, it's like a donut chart, but it's actually a little bit more effective than that. I'm not a huge fan of donut or pie charts. But what I do like about this one is it gives you the ability to actually split up the values that you see here. So, for example, all that you see in red is New York. Um, again, let me make it very clear. I am not a fan of pie charts or donut charts. But what this one has and does effectively is it allows you to see the distribution of values with inside of these different sections. And you can actually nest values inside of each other. So things like I have city is uh, showing New York in red. And I can select city. And you can actually see the value for that in the middle when you select it. And by the way, you can bump up the text size and underneath the format section. I can also see if I select individual items here, I can see the individual different uh, positions that uh, I have inside of each of these cities and what percentage of the total uh, makeup of my data set they, they uh, pertail. So that's an interesting way that you can work with this as well. So Sunburst is okay. It's better than a, a regular donut chart, but again, I wanted to show you early on how you can kind of work with and play around with some custom visuals. Now, if you haven't really worked with custom visuals a ton yet, you can find custom visuals in one of two places. They're, they're in the process of actually moving them. They haven't completed that move yet. But you can find them if you go to visuals.powerbi.com is the place where they are all currently stored. So if you go to visuals.powerbi.com, you'll find a list of about 75 to 80 different visuals that you can download, and, and Sunburst is one of these. But right now, they're in the process of moving all these visuals to the Office Store. And so where you're going to find them in the future is by going to store.office.com. And you'll find them then underneath the Power BI section. Now, I'm going to come back here later and show you how to actually work with this, uh, this website and how you can go download and bring in custom visuals from this new area and a little bit later. But I wanted to get you a peek at what that looks like now. All right, so we got our first demonstration here, a very quick one, but it gives you an idea here of how you can actually take this information and be able to pull it together. Now, the next one I'm going to show you is a little bit more complex. It's actually a lot more complex because not only are we going to be able to going to need to take data like this that's formatted in subtotals like that, uh, but I also want to be able to merge multiple data sets together. So I'm going to close this example out. We're going to open up a completely new instance of Power BI Desktop for this one. Oop, that's PowerPoint. Let's try that again. Here we go. And so what we're going to do in this next example is a little bit more complex. We're going to pull in multiple data sources, and we're going to show you some really complex uh, inner workings of how the query editor works as far as the transforms that are available to you. And then we're going to start to get into some R. So hopefully you're excited about looking at some R. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start by going to get some data. And the uh, data source that we're going to use to start off with is actually a text file. So I'm going to use a text slash CSV connector. And the data that we're data we're pulling in for this example is going to be from a file called FIPS County name right here. Now, in case you're curious what FIPS stands for, that is the Federal Information Processing Standard. It's just how you kind of identify how the Postal Service identifies counties, uh, so that how the government does. So I'm going to hit open to bring in this new data source. And as I bring in this new data source, you can get a peek at what it looks like here as a text file. And I'll hit edit to go ahead and load it in. All right, and then now what we're going to do is we're going to work with this data and kind of do something somewhat similar to what we did in the previous example. We're going to start first by kind of splitting out the data that we have. We're also going to work with and, and show you the fact that Power BI oftentimes likes to do data type conversions for you automatically. There's some things that Power BI will attempt to do automatically for you, and changing data types is one of those things. You'll see over here in the Applied Steps section I showed you earlier that in this case, Power BI is automatically trying to convert the data type of the first column that I have. The first column I have right now doesn't have a name, but it's automatically converting the data type for me, and I don't want it to do that. So despite me not really telling it to do data type conversions, it's trying to do its best guess based on the data coming in on how it should convert data types. Now, there's two, two ways you can stop this. If you don't want it to convert data types, you can stop it in one of two ways. One is you can come over to the Applied Steps section. You can hit X, and that means it will unconvert, it'll undo or delete that uh, transform that you had added or really Power BI had added. Now, the problem is 
as we start to do multiple transforms in here, it's going to automatically add that back. And let me show you what I mean as we get through this. Uh, I'll show you how it's automatically going to add in that change type again, and I want to show you how you can permanently turn that off so it won't happen anymore, because that's something that often happens whenever you're working with this tool. So the first thing that I want to do is go ahead and change my query name. I'll start by calling this county instead of what it was called originally. And then we're going to start to uh, actually split up this data a little bit. So what I'd like to do is I want to take the county names in here. I want to split the county name, and so I have the county and state separately. And then I want to take the fully spelled out st state name, and I want to duplicate that all the way down here as well. So to get started, what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and split this column. So this one here called column two. If we want to split a column, you can do that by right-clicking on it and selecting that you want to do a split column right here. And we want to split on a delimiter. So I'll select by delimiter. Then once I select by delimiter, it is a comma, but it's not only a comma, it's also a space. You'll see comma space here. So I'm going to make this into a custom delimiter because it's not just a comma, it's a comma and a space here. All right, so we're going to tell it we want to split this value. I'll hit OK, and you'll see that it now splits this into two separate columns, one with the county, one with the state abbreviation. Now, you'll remember I mentioned a few moments ago that it automatically converts data types here. So you'll see here on the left-hand side that it's automatically converted these data types for me, but that's not what I wanted it to do. Remember I told you that's something that can happen as you work on these transforms. So what I want to do is not only remove that from happening this one time by hitting X, I want to make sure that it doesn't automatically convert data types for me ever again. And there is an option to do that. You can do that by going underneath the File menu in the top left, and underneath File you'll go to Options, and Options again. And basically what we're looking for here is an option in here underneath the data load section. Uh, let's see, no, it's not under data load. It's under data load down here. There's an option here called automatically detect column types and headers for unstructured data. And so what this is doing is automatically whenever we go to connect a certain data source, and not only is it going to convert data types for us automatically based on what it thinks they should be, it's also going to automatically promote headers, what it thinks my column header name should be. Well, I don't want it to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck that dete the type detection and then hit OK, and now it'll no longer attempt to automatically convert data types for me because in this case it was actually doing it incorrectly. All right, good, good deal. So we've taken care of that one item. The next thing that we want to do is we want to filter out the United States from here. So I'm going to get rid of the United States by hitting the down arrow and I'll just search for United States, and I'm going to uncheck United States here and hit OK. Just get rid of that from this data set. I don't need the country name in here. I just want the state and county names. The next thing that we're going to do is similar to what we did in the previous example. We're going to tell it any time we see a null value, we want to take the rows that have null values and bring the state name over into its own, own column alone here. So what I'll do to do that is we'll go up to the Add Column section again. We'll say Custom Column once more. We'll call this one state this time, and in this one what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if the column 2.2, which is this one right here, if column 2.2 is null, should have renamed those columns, huh? then we'll turn back column 2.1, else null. So simple little uh, M query here again, that's the query language behind the scenes, and I'll hit OK. And it's now brought over that column here. And just like we did in the previous example, we could do something like fill down to duplicate this value all the way down. So I could go underneath the uh, make sure I have state selected, go under transform and select fill down again. And it's going to duplicate that value all the way down until there's another state name to replace it with. So here you can see Alaska comes in and it replaces everything with Alaska. All right. Good deal. So we've gotten to some of this taken care of. I'm going to go ahead and filter out the nulls for states because that will get rid of the state header. And we've got that taken care of. We have a decent looking uh, little query here. I do notice here that it looks like I spelled county wrong. Let's spell that correctly. There we go. And now I have this query taken care of. Now I want to bring in multiple queries because there's a few other things that I want to do. So to do that, to bring in another query that we want to join together, I would go over to the home ribbon here and select new, new source. And this source is going to come from a CSV file again. So I'm going to search for CSV file, yeah, or text. It's actually, it's actually a text file, excuse me. And the file is going to be called, in this scenario, it's going to be called data set. And I'll hit open. Now, this one's a little bit unique as well in that we have a different set of problems we need to solve with this one. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK and bring this query in. Okay. 
And then, uh, by the way, Matthew asked a good, a good question that's really quick to address. So I'll go ahead and address this question. Are you, sh are you sure it's sorted by uh, state correctly in order to do fill down? So yes, um, it actually, Matthew is correct. It does need to be sorted properly for fill down to work. And in this case, it is. It's kind of sorted it properly here by default. Uh, otherwise, you're right, I would be in trouble if I just kind of assumed that everything was sorted properly in here. But in this case, it, it actually was. So good, good point to bring up there. All right, so back to the one here called data set. We're going to go ahead and start by renaming this one. I'll call this one query demographics. And what we want to do is we're going to start first by um, noticing that the fact that it did not push my column headers up into the header section. And you might remember why. I just showed you a few moments ago. We turned off the ability that uh, Power BI would automatically detect headers. And because of that, you'll see this first row is actually our column headers, but it's left, left in the first row. So because we turned off that feature a few moments ago, we'll need to use this little button up in the top here that says use first row as headers. And that'll push this first row up into the header section where it's called column five, column six, column seven. That will now make it so that these are the column names like so. All right, good deal. So we've got that taken care of. Now the next thing I wanna do is actually take the columns that we have and I need to turn them into rows. And there's a reason why we're gonna do this that may not make sense quite yet, but as we get to our last file, it'll really start to make sense because these are measurements that we want, but I really want to map these measurements to a data dictionary that we're going to bring in in a few moments. So what I'm going to do to change these columns into rows is I'm going to select the FIPS column here on the far left, far, yeah, far left. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to select to do an unpivot other columns. And basically that, what that does when I, let me show you that one more time. I did it kind of fast. I'm going to select the column that I want to leave alone which is the FIPS column, I'll right click on it and tell it to do an unpivot of all of the other columns here. And basically it converts all the other columns into rows now. So I can see all of these other measures and what the value was that was returned back for them. And that's by using a little transform called unpivot. In this case, we did unpivot others. Okay, the one last thing I wanna do with this data set is I wanna convert the value column into a decimal number. So you can convert data types by selecting the little tag on the top right left of the column header and I'll select decimal number here. And then that one should be good to go. So let's now pull in my very last data set for this example. So for my last data set, I'm gonna go up to new sources again. And it's gonna be a CSV file again, right here. And hit connect. And this time we're gonna pull in a data set called data dictionary. So I'll select the data dictionary one, I'll hit open. And you can see this is the kind of file that we're gonna work with this time. It's all kind of stored, everything's stored into a single column, so it's really messy in this scenario. So I'm gonna walk you through how you can solve this problem this, in this case. So I'll hit okay. We're gonna bring this new file in. And the first thing that we're gonna do, of course, is to go ahead and rename this. We wanna make sure we follow that best practice of renaming these, something more appropriate as soon as we get them pulled in. So I'm gonna go ahead and rename this to data dictionary. We're also gonna work with splitting columns, but not based off of a del delimiter like we did last time. We're gonna split columns based off of a number of characters. So to split this column based off of a number of characters, you'll right click and you'll say that you want to do a split column again. And then we're gonna select by number of characters, okay? Then we'll tell it that we want to, and by the way, I did the research ahead of time so you weren't having to watch me count a number of characters here. We want to split by the first set of characters to be the first nine characters from the left. So look at the first uh, nine characters from the left, and that's our first column. So I've changed this to here, uh, only split from the left, I'll hit OK. It's now split that on the left-hand side for the first nine characters. And by the way, just to be safe, I'm also going to do a trim on this. You can do a trim on your data sets by hitting transform and trim to make sure any empty spaces that are in there are also removed. All right, now we have the second column here. So in the second column, we also wanna do another split. So I'll right click on it and we'll do a split column again by a number of characters. And then I'm gonna split this one based on, let's see, it is 88 characters long from the left point. So I'll hit okay. It's now split this into two separate data sets here or two separate columns, really three columns. This last column, however, I don't really need. So I'm gonna right click on this last column and go ahead and remove that one. I'll trim this one up as well. You can see that there's some empty spaces here on the first column value where I see item description has uh, the empty spaces. And so I wanna get rid of those empty spaces by right clicking and tell it to do a transform trim again, just like we did the first time. All right, now we just wanna put the first row up into the header section. We have our column names and we're looking like we're in good shape here. We've got all the things taken care of for this one. 
And now we can start to actually merge these three separate queries together. We have a county query, uh, uh, query demographic, data dictionary. Let's bring these three separate queries together now in this example. And the way we'll do that is by going up into the merge query section here. This is basically like doing a join in SQL. So if you come from a SQL Server background or, or have written SQL in any structured query uh, platform, then this is like doing a join inside of a, a SQL query. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a join, and in our join, we're actually going to create a brand new query. So we're going to create a fourth query that combines all four of these together. The way we'll do that is we'll hit the down arrow on, on the merge queries option. We'll select merge queries as new. And when we do that, it's going to output this as a brand new query. Now we're going to merge the data dictionary with the query, the, uh, that should be, yeah, query demographics here. There we go. And so we're going to merge together the date, data item and the attribute here as our join column. So we're going to join on the data item and the attribute together to be able to return back our values in here from these two different data sets. All right. Then we're going to tell what kind of join do we want to do. Now, the join in this case, it's you can see here on the bottom that it says the selection has matched 53 out of 54 rows. So there's one row that doesn't exist in our second data set that does exist, or actually vice versa. We have 53 out of 54 rows from our first. So there's one row that's missing basically out of the data sets. And so we have to decide, is that row that important? Do we need to actually go back and make sure we do this as a left outer join so we still get that row? Or do we not really care about that missing row and we just want to do an inner join because we have to have the description that goes along with each of these metrics? And in my case, I don't really care about this one that happens to be missing, so I'm going to do an inner join here to only return back the rows that match. I'll hit OK. And once I do that, you'll notice here that it does create a new query here for us called Merge1. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to take this, and you'll see it's created a new column for me right here. And I want to take this and I want to bring back the value that comes from our second data set. And the way that you do that is by hitting on this little expand button up in the top right. By hitting that, you can tell it that you want to return back which of the columns from the other data set you were joining to. So in this case, I only really need to bring back the value because I already have in it the, and actually I'm going to bring back FIPS as well because we'll need that later. And I'll hit uh, OK. So it's now brought back each of those columns for me. And I can see back the FIPS column and the values column have now been brought back into this data set. So I've brought back together two different data sets. They've been merged together. You can see it's kind of duplicating values, but that's because of the FIPS code that we're, we have in here. The FIPS code is actually duplicating some of the values in here. Um, and it looks like we still have, let me check on something for one moment. Looks like it's still bringing back the uh, United States here as a value. Let me get rid of the United States. That was the 0001 there. All right, there we go. So we've got that value brought in here. Now what I want to do is I want to merge in one more query. So I'm going to go back up here to the top, and rather than merging and creating a new query, we're going to merge in with our existing query we're looking at right now. So I'll just select Merge Queries. We're now going to join in the county information, and it looks like I never named the columns here, so that's my fault. I should have gone through to name all those columns. But we're going to now merge in using the FIPS code in column one here, and we'll do an enter join once again and hit OK. So basically, we're pulling together all this information. Oh, let's try that one more time. I think the order that I did my join is a little bit messed up. Let me do that one more time here. Let's actually join on the demographics column. I think that's the one I intended to join on, but I kind of did it a little bit backwards there. Let me do that one more time. Just going through those steps one more time here. And then we're going to merge once more. This time on the FIPS code, I think this will get it. Okay. And there's the column names. There we go. All right, so I think I had just kind of changed the order. I did the order incorrectly there. Oh, it's still giving me a little issue there. But the issue here, I believe, has to do with uh, some trailing spaces that exist in my data set. So there's probably the issue that we're finding here is that there is some extra space in one of these two data sets. Now, I thought I trimmed. So you would think, oh, I see it right there. So there's actually some trailing spaces here in my data set that we're looking at. So let me do a quick trim. And just like any kind of SQL join, if you're trying to join on something that has spaces, that space actually counts as value. So you need to make sure that it's kind of cleaned up here. And let's hope that that fixed the issue. Let's try and do that join one more time. All right, so we're joining on FIPS and we're joining on County. Let's try that one more time here. Here we go. 
there we go, that was the problem. So after I kind of trimmed up those spaces that I had, uh, and you're right, Tony, it all absolutely could be a data type issue in some cases. In this case, that wasn't it. It was I actually had some spaces that were still hanging around in there that I needed to get rid of. Now, to get those columns back from the uh, other data set that we're working with, we need to hit this little expand button here and tell it that we want to bring back the description of our metric, and we also want to bring back the county name from our county query here, which, again, I've kind of made the mistake here of not naming these properly. But let's go ahead and bring back the first column and the last column. I believe those are the two I want. There we go. So we now have a data set in here that's looking pretty good. And we can really play around with this. What I can do is I can now bring this. Let's go ahead and name this. We'll call this uh, All Demographics. And I can now bring this and actually bring this back into Power BI. I can hit Save and Apply here. Or close and apply, bring this now into Power BI. Now, one of the things that you'll often want to do is actually disable these three queries. These queries here, county, county demographics, and data dictionary. You may want to disable those three because the all demographics in the bottom encompasses all three of those for the purposes of what we need here. It's actually pretty easy to disable those if I wanted to, and if I didn't want to see those in the field list, I can go back up to the edit query section here, and I can actually disable by right-clicking. I can uncheck this enable load option. And basically what that does is it still stores the metadata of the query, and you can preview it as well. But whenever it comes to viewing the report, when I uncheck this Enable Load option, you will no longer see it inside of the Data Visualization section. You can see here it's actually grayed them out as well so that you know that Enable Load has been turned off. Now if I hit Close and Apply, you'll see those three queries are gone. I only have the All Demographics because that's really the only one I need. All the other queries are really things that I combined in this one that we're looking at here now. All right, so real quickly, let's just show you what we can do with this now. So we brought in these three different files. We can now bring into, let's say we want to bring in something like a fill map. So I'll bring in a fill map here, and I want to bring in the county, okay? And what we could have done as well is we could have actually combined, like, the, the county and the state together to make this a more, uh, a more accurate visualization of county. But you can see here in this visual, this map that we just created, it is actually mapping out each of the counties here for us that we have in our data set. And what I can do is I can actually bring in, let's say, for example, the value, which is our metric that we're trying to analyze here. And that's going to place it underneath the color saturation. And then I want to determine which measure it is I want to analyze. So I'm going to bring in the item description as a slicer here. And basically why I want to do that is because this is now going to allow me to kind of toggle back and forth between different metrics that I want to analyze. So you can see in here, maybe for example, I want to look at where most of the veterans live. So I can select the veterans metric here, and you can see it's going to repopulate my map, and I can see where most of the veterans live in the United States, at least during that time period for this metric. Looks like a lot of them are over here, at least the ones that were recorded for the purposes of this data set are recorded to be over in kind of uh, Los Angeles County. We have quite a few over in Clark County in uh, uh, Nevada here as well. Uh, you can kind of flip around here. It looks like in my hometown there's a few here as well in Duval County that's close by me. There's quite a few in Jefferson County, Alabama. So it's kind of a nice way to be able to use and, and toggle back and forth between different measures the way we've organized this because I can easily now select things like um, the retail sales, and I can see where most retail sales are occurring in the United States. And it looks like a lot of this data was kind of collected in that certain area there. So uh, one question that just came in that's relevant to what we're talking about here is how would, the, how would disabling those data sets affect the data refresh? And the good news is it actually doesn't affect it at all. So whenever we go to do our data refresh, it will still refresh. It's just going to be calling those subqueries basically that we had, those three queries that I did enable, uh, turned off the enabled feature for. It's still going to be able to use those and leverage those in our one all demographics query uh, it basically calls those queries within this one. It's just making it so that you don't see them multiple times. So whenever I go to refresh, it's going to refresh all demographics, which, which in turn also refreshes the other queries as well. It's calling them as well. It's a good question. All right, so we've got a couple in here. This is our first uh, real kind of thorough example. We spent quite a bit of time on this one. We're now going to talk here uh, after break. I'm going to go ahead and take our break here in a few moments, and we'll take a short break. Uh, but we're next going to talk about really performance tuning and making sure that query performance is most optimal and the best that it can be uh, through something called query folding. And I did see quite a few questions in the chat about query folding. I was kind of holding off answering them until uh, this next discussion. So what I'm going to do real quickly is I'm going to also bring up before our break 
a special offer that we have for you guys today for attending. Uh, we actually have a, a set of on-demand training classes that are part of our curriculum. We have five different Power BI courses, uh, which include Power BI desktops and dashboards, which is all around the tool that we're talking about today. We also have a Power BI custom visuals class, and we have two Power BI Excel courses, one that's focused, focused on Power Query and one that's focused on kind of Power Pivot, Power Query, and Power View instead of Excel. And then we have a new course that we just released last week, which is around DAX. So those of you that said that we have users that are struggling a bit with DAX, we just released an introduction to DAX course that's part of, all five of these courses are part of something called a Power BI pack that we offer. And these are on-demand training courses. I recommend if you could take a look at that, take a look at our on-demand training courses on our website, and you'll be able to see that we have quite a few courses specifically around Power BI, and because you're attending today, you'll get 25% off of those. So you'll uh, let us know if, you, if you're interested in that, and we'll be happy to kind of connect you with the right individual, individuals to purchase. Uh, so what I'm going to do next, I'm going to put five minutes on the clock here to take a quick break, and when we come back, I'll try and get as many of the questions as I can, and then we'll move on. All right, see you guys in five minutes.
All right, so I'm going to try and answer, uh, do intermittent questions here after each break. Um, real quickly, let's kind of answer a couple of these here. So there was a question about, uh, is it 25 or 20 first percent off? It's 20% off using the code on the screen right now if you're interested in that Power BI pack. Um, some other questions that we had. Um, oh, this was a good question that someone asked around larger data sets and refreshes. And so one, their question is really around how do I deal with refreshing of large data sets, especially when um, Power BI doesn't really support incremental data refreshes. And so I think this is, this is Deepak. Uh, great question. It is very frustrating, you're right. And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you when, when it comes to the perspective of Power BI. So Power BI uh, does not, and, and, and I, I haven't seen any news that it's gonna change anytime soon, does not support incremental data refreshes. What, what most people will do is that's when they turn to more of a corporate solution where they'll actually create a tabular model. So they'll create an analysis services tabular model and they'll use that tabular model, which does allow for incremental data refreshes. And by, by the way, for those of you that aren't really familiar with analysis services tabular, it's like the corporate version of Power BI uh, and really the modeling side of it at least. It doesn't have any data visualization capabilities. It's more of a connector that you would use to connect uh, data visualization tools on top of. But it handles all that data import, the, da the uh, data modeling, creating relationships. It's more the corporate version of that where you can kind of support larger refreshes of data and you can also do incremental refreshes there as well. Um, question, will the new quick measures make it less necessary? Oh, good question. So this is, uh, well, the new, there's a new feature came out yesterday. I'm going to show a little bit of this feature uh, later today. Will the new feature quick measures make it less necessary to know DAX in the future? Um, it will certainly help. If you've played around with this new feature, and again, if you haven't seen this new feature, it was just released yesterday. I'm going to show more of it later today. It, um, it does write a lot of DAX for you. Unfortunately, it writes some pretty complex DAX that you could probably write on your own a lot more simple or a lot, uh, a lot cleaner. The other thing that with that new feature, the new quick measures feature, is you have to use, uh, for many of them, especially the time intelligence ones, you have to use the date hierarchy that's automatically generated inside of Power BI. And I have a problem with that because frankly, I wanna be able to create my own hierarchy. There's some things that I wanna be able to do that I wanna build uh, calculations and time intelligence off of that aren't necessarily the default date hierarchy. So I don't think it's necessarily gonna make it all together go away, but it's gonna help a lot of people learn how to write DAX because it's gonna write a lot of it for them and then they can look at it and see what it's doing. And then they can also make some adjustments to it. Um, Oh, uh, Eric asked a question. I just downloaded the latest version of the Power BI desktop and I don't see the Power BI service as an option, data set option, is it not available yet? Here's what you're missing, Eric. For some of the things I'm gonna show you today, they're still in preview. So that feature is still in preview. If you wanna enable that feature, you'll go up to the file menu. And this, this is the same case for any preview feature, by the way, guys. You'll go up to file, you'll go to options and settings, and you'll select options. And you'll see there's a section here devoted to preview features right here. And there's a big list. There's a big list of things that are in preview. I don't have all of them turned on right now, but I have quite a few of them turned on. And one of them that I have turned on is the one here called Power BI Service Live Connection. And if you turn that on, uh, after you turn on these preview features, by the way, it'll prompt you to uh, close and restart Power BI, not your whole machine, just Power BI, the desktop tool. And once you do that, you'll see that feature now is available. So that's why you're missing it. Um, Let's see, any other ones that we're, we really need to get going here? So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna try and look at some of these as we keep going. Uh, so one here that I'll try and briefly answer, uh, when should you choose tabular model over Power BI model? So that's a loaded question. <laughs> the, uh, we actually have a section of a class that we devote about an hour to talking about that. But to, to make it as brief, as brief as possible, tabular is gonna scale a little bit better. Um, we talked about a feature a few moments ago where Tabular actually has the ability to do things like incremental loading, where Power BI does not. So if you want to incrementally refresh the data inside your model, Tabular is the only way to do that. Uh, you also have the ability to really have more control because it's a Tabular instance, uh, at least the on-premises version of Tabular, you can control the resources that are available to that. Um, there's actually some settings on the Tabular server itself where you can kind of control the memory usage. Uh, that's that's being given to tabular. So there's there's some things that we can go super deep into it. Just think of it this way: if you do go to tabular, it's for scalability purposes typically, but you also lose some control 
So if you're if you're if you're going to tabular, your users will lose some control because when they're in Power BI, they have a lot of flexibility with what they can create and the the things they can develop. When they go to tabular, more of the the development is pushed over to IT rather than end users or analysts or whoever is doing your Power BI development now. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're at 12 o'clock, though. I want to go ahead and get started back on content. That was kind of my goal to start back at 12. Uh, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to close out of this example. And we're going to bring up another one. And what we're going to do in this next one is we're going to talk through something that many of you guys, it sounds like at least have some knowledge of already. Maybe you're very familiar with it. Something called query folding. And I've talked about this quite a bit in other uh, examples or other webinars that we've done, but it's worth bringing up here again because it's it's definitely something more advanced because you don't always think about this the, the, the how things are running behind the scenes and that's really what query folding is about it's how the query engine behind Power BI works okay so basically the idea here of query folding is it's taking any of the queries that you design inside the query editor and it's pushing it back to the server okay so the idea here meaning that rather than my desktop churning through all this data and trying to be able to pull together this information inside of the Power BI desktop, it's actually going to take what I do inside the query editor, convert it to the native language of the data source, and that way the data source itself, the server that the data is coming from, will perform the query instead of my desktop. And as you can imagine, your server that you're trying to pull data out of can churn through and produce query results much faster than your laptop or desktop can. So ideally, you want all of your queries to use query folding, but there's going to be, certainly be some circumstances where your queries do not use query folding. Uh, and there's a couple scenarios I want to talk about here. So really, the first thing here is it depends on the source system that you're pulling from. So depending on the source system that you're using, if, say, for example, I'm pulling from a text file like I was earlier. Uh, if I'm pulling from a text file, there is no server behind the scenes that it can fold to. There's no server that it can convert my uh, query to so that it can actually use uh, the server backend. There is no server, it's just a text file. So if you're pulling from a data source that has nowhere to send the information to or convert the query to, then obviously it's not going to use query folding in that case. So somebody asked the question earlier uh, when it came to using fill down. I, I was using fill down earlier and somebody popped in a question, well if you use fill down is that going to be folded? Uh, well, uh, the answer is no, because I was using a text file, but it's also no if I was using SQL Server, and that's because of the next bullet point here. Not all transforms can be folded. So basically the idea here is if I can convert, or really if Power BI can convert what I'm doing in the query editor to something in the data source, then it will be folded. But if I'm trying to do something in the query editor that doesn't exist in the data source, then there's no way for it to be folded. So for example, if I'm trying to do something like uh, uh, fill down, that fill down example we did earlier, if I was connected to a SQL Server, it would not be able to fold that query because there's nothing inside of SQL Server that's comparable to fill down to basically take a value and duplicate it down until you see something else without you having to write some very complex uh, cursor of some kind. So there's many cases that depending on the data source, depending on the transforms you're using, query folding will not take place. Now you can have some queries that are partially folded. Okay, and basically what I mean by that is you have a list of all these transforms that you do on the, in, in, in the uh, uh, little query window on the right-hand side that we showed you earlier. I'll show it to you again here in a few moments. And let's say you have 10 different transforms that you're performing on your data set. And the first seven of your transforms are pretty simple. You're filtering the data, you're uh, renaming columns, that sort of thing. All, all those things you can do inside SQL Server. If I was connected to a SQL Server, I can rename a column, I can filter down a data set very easily with a where clause or an alias of a column. But as soon as I try to do something like fill down, or if I try to do something like capitalize each word, which is another transform that's available in here that doesn't exist in SQL Server. As soon as I try and do a transform inside of Power BI that there is no corresponding SQL code for inside SQL Server, the, the, the query is no longer folded from that point going down. Okay, so again, if I have 10 transforms, the seventh one all of a sudden uses a transform that's not available inside SQL Server, everything after that is no longer folded. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at how this works. So if I were to, uh, let's launch an example. I'm going to actually go uh, launch Open Power BI Desktop again. I should have one of these already handy, ready to go. 
And what we're going to do in this case is I'm actually going to connect to my local instance of SQL Server and walk you through how query folding works. Okay, so I'm going to connect into my local SQL Server here. And I have a local instance. And I'll select the database on the next page here. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the Worldwide Importers DW for this example. And I'm going to pull in the dimension.city table. All right. All right, good deal. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this data. I'm going to show you how query folding works, how you know that your query is actually being folded or not inside of the Power BI desktop. So the first way that we're going to test this out is I'm going to show you how we can apply a pretty simple little filter on this. So I'm going to go find the sales territory table here, for example, right here, a column. I'm going to find the sales territory column, and I'm going to filter this to just return back the southeast results. Okay? So I'll hit OK. It's now filtered those results down to only show southeast. Now, with that done, I can prove out that that little filter was folded and was pushed back to the server. And here's how I can prove that out. If I go over to the Applied Steps section on the right-hand side, right over here, you'll see that there is the ability to right-click on these steps or transforms, like so. And I can see this option here called View Native Query. That view native query option, what it does is it actually shows you this query converted into SQL code against the data source. So if I select view native query, it actually shows me the select statement that's used against SQL Server here, including, check this out, the where clause that applies the filter. So this is an example where query folding has taken place. It's actually taken what I've filtered inside of the query editor and it's now converted that into a WHERE clause inside of T-SQL. So that's good. That's query folding working. That's how you can validate that query folding is working as well. Oop, I didn't mean to close that. Let me go back to that. Now, here's an example where you can see query folding stop working. So if I were to do something like this, let's say that I went over to the city column, and I can see that the city column over here is all lowercase. All the cities are lowercase. And so what I want to do is I want to capitalize each of the city names. And so to do that, I would right click on city, I would go to transform, and use this transform here called capitalize each word. Now, capitalize each word is one of those transforms that does not exist inside SQL Server. So what happens whenever I go over to the applied steps se section this time, and I right click on apply, uh, capitalize each word, you'll notice that view native query is now grayed out. I can't select that anymore because the, the query from this point going down, everything below capitalize each word is now no longer going to be converted into SQL code, but everything above that is. So I can still right click on filtered rows right here, and I can still see that the view native query option is still available. So I can still do this, but it has to be done um, uh, in a certain order. So what the benefit is, and what, one of the things you should realize here when it comes to query folding, is the order of your transforms can impact performance. Remember I told you earlier that everything runs sequentially here, nothing runs in parallel. So you can actually control the performance of your queries by the order of the transforms that you have. So for example, let's say that I needed to apply one other transform, and the next transform that I want to do is I want to um, combine two column names together. I want to combine the city and the state together. So I have city, state here. I want to combine those together into a single column. Um, and so I can do that by, there's really two different ways you can do that. But let me show you one way, and I'll tell you a little trick about the other way. Let's say I want to combine city and state together. I could go up to add column, add a custom column, and I can tell it I want to combine city, and I want to concatenate that with a comma and the state name. Okay, so simple little uh, M query here to be able to combine those two columns together. Now, if I hit OK, I have a new column here called custom, and I'll go ahead and call this city state. Now, think about this. If I was actually running this against a SQL server, there is no reason why I wouldn't be able to have a, a select statement where I combine two column names together, where I can combine city, comma, state together. I can do that inside of SQL Server fairly easily with the SQL code there. But because of the transforms that we've already done, you can see whenever I right click on rename columns here, you can see that the view native query option is not available. And that's because 
this capitalize each word. Everything below capitalize each word is not available to be folded. So what you can do is you can resort these transforms. I can tell it that I want to push this add column or add custom. You can see right now I can't view the native query, but what I can do is I can move it up. I can right click on added custom, move it up above capitalize each word, and I'll also move up rename column. And now what happens is those two transforms are going to be folded, and then everything after that, like capitalize each word, will not be folded. So check this out. If I right-click on rename columns now, you'll see view native query is available. So I'll select that. And you can see that it looks like it did fold this. It did convert it into SQL code here for me. Okay, and that's good. We want it to do that because that means it's going to run that against the server instead of trying to do it on my desktop or laptop. Now, capitalize each word is still not going to work. Capitalize each word still does not have the ability to uh, work inside. Keep closing that. Capitalize each word still does not have the ability to fold because that function or that, that transform just does not have anything comparable inside of SQL Server. So everything after that, however, will not be folded. So the order that you do these things does matter. You can impact performance based on the order you select things. Now let me show you one other thing that's kind of interesting. Some of you actually, I saw in the chat, asked this. I created a custom column that combines city and state together. Well, there's a field in here. You can actually, there's a transform in here where you can select city and state, multi-select those, and you can right-click on them and tell it to merge. Why didn't I do that? There's a reason why I didn't, because this option actually does something different in the M query, and it would not be folded. Let me show you what I mean by that. So if I select city and state, right-click on them and select merge columns, I can tell it that I want to have a comma separator with a space, and then I can call this uh, city state not folded, hit OK. So I create a brand new, or uh, I create another column here called city state not folded. Let's see, did that break my old column? Nope, still there. But now you'll notice that if I were to right click on merge columns, in fact, let me even move it up. Let me move it above capitalize each word. If I right click on merge columns, you'll notice that the view native query doesn't work here. There's something in the way that it's using the merge columns options versus the uh, custom column option where it's not able to determine that it's a simple concatenating of values here, a concatenating of column names. So just keep that in mind. There's some transforms you really want to look at and verify that they're doing what you think they should be doing. Let me delete that transform. All right, good deal. So we've got that. We've talked about query folding. Now let's talk about something that I find really interesting, and I hope you will as well. I'm going to close this out. And I don't really, I don't really need to build any example here. I just wanted to show you their query folding. But what I find really interesting that we're going to cover today is the R query language and the R scripting language. So many of you said earlier that you did not have any experience with R. And guess what? I don't have a ton of experience with R either. But I know where to go find some good resources where I can pick up and not only learn a little bit of R, but I can also copy examples that other people have done and then make them my own. Uh, and there's actually there's some libraries that you can go download code from that uh, will make this much easier for you as well. So why do you need R? There's actually three different places in Power BI that you can use R. You can use R whenever it comes to actually connecting to a data source. Okay, so I can go connect to a data source using the R scripting language. And uh, that's going to be one of the first options that we, uh, actually that's the second option that we're going to show. You can also use the R query language when it comes to transforms. So whenever you are working and manipulating data, maybe there's something that you want to do to manipulate the data that you just don't have the ability to do inside of Power BI. That's where the R scripting language can come in and help, help quite a bit actually. Because the R scripting language is a library full of statistic, statistical analysis language uh, for, functions, as well as graphical analysis functions as well, and it's a library of thousands of different types of transforms of data cleansing transforms you can do, and again, it also has data visualization capabilities in it. And so it's really beneficial for you to at least take a peek at what's available there because you might find that there's some things that you can use in there to enhance what you're doing inside of Power BI because there's no limits when it comes to Power BI. There's thousands of other uh, libraries of code that you can use and import and make part of your own solution. Now, if you want to do this, if you want to actually use the R query language, there's a couple steps you need to do first. One is you need to install, uh, you need to install R. <laughs> you got to install R to be able to work with it. Uh, and there's an installation link here, but here's really the best way for you to find this. Rather than you having to try and write down this right now, what I would suggest you do 
is this. Let me uh, tell you what, let me launch another instance here, Power BI. I'll close this one out. So here's what I would suggest you do. If you're really interested in working with R, is I would suggest that you, uh, when, when you want to work with R, go up to the options menu. So go to File and select Options and Options again. And what you'll find inside the Options section is there is an R scripting section right here. And this actually gives, does give you some guidance on what do you need to get started. So if I select the R scripting section, you can see there's a little hyperlink here that says how to install R. If you select that, it actually walks you through what do you need to get started. You need to, uh, it even has some examples here of using it. So it shows you how to enable R. Uh, it even has where do you go to install it right here. So you can download the Open R um, right here by selecting that. And then you can download R on your machine, whether it's Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever it may be. You can download R and start to use it on your machine. Okay. So by the way, so someone asked if I can show that link again. All you have to do, how, to, how I got here, was you go underneath, this is inside of Power BI, you go to File, Options and Settings, and then Options, and then you'll find underneath R Scripting, this option here where you can see how to install R. And that's where if you go there, you can go install the, the components for R, and then you can start working with it on your machines. Now, you may, uh, as you get deeper into this, want to install some of the other uh, IDEs for working with R, like R Studio is a nice interface for being able to write code in. And uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll actually write their code inside of R Studio first and then bring it into Power BI. I'll show you a little example of that later. But it gives you the ability to have a nice interface for writing the code and then come plug it into Power BI because Power BI doesn't have a super great R scripting interface. It's basically a text box where you go to drop your code in. Okay, But if you go to how, how to install R, this is where it took you. Let me take a step back here. And you select uh, to go to the download page for Re Revolution Open R. You go there, and you can download it for Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, whatever you need. And once you download and install the components for R, here's what you'll get. You'll actually be able to then launch the Microsoft R Open. So you can see Microsoft R Open, and this is the latest version, by the way. I just went and checked that before we did our webinar yesterday. So you can launch R here, and you can actually write code in there. You can also separately download the R Studio tool. So if you download R Studio, that's another tool that you can use for writing R. Okay. And by the way, yes, good question, Michael. It is free. So all this stuff is free. There's nothing that you have to. It's all open source. You don't have to. Uh, there is some versions of it that you can. If for R Studio, for example, there is some paid versions of R Studio. But all the stuff I'm going to show you today, you can do for free. Now, here's the example of how we're going to use R. Okay. The example of what we're going to do, let me show you the file that we're going to be working with here. Okay, so the data that we're going to be working with is going to be European stock market data. And this is actually an example that you can find on the Power BI uh, site as well, the blog site. And basically what we want to do is we have the stock market index for each day. Okay, so we have a list of days here in the first column. And then, let me zoom in on this. So here's my list of days, and there's the stock market index for each day listed next to it. But occasionally, the values aren't recorded. So you can see on the 15th it wasn't recorded, on the 20th it wasn't recorded, on the 30th it wasn't recorded, the 35th, so on and so forth. There's multiple days in here where I don't have any recording of what the index was for the stock market and the European stock market. And so what I'd like to do is I want to be able to replace those NA values with it, my best guess of what those values should have been. Based on all the results around it, I want to do a prediction on what the value should have been for the 15th and the 20th and the 29th and the 34th, and I want to take my predicted value and replace it so I have something to represent there rather than nothing, okay? So it's kind of an interesting way to be able to do that. So let's say that we want to do this. Let's actually walk through this example. I'm going to go back over to Power BI. And uh, by the way, after you install R, here's one step I need to mention. I, I, I neglected to mention this part. After you install and go through the installation for, for R, you're going to notice that it's going to prompt you to uh, give it a file path during the installation. So during the install of the tool, you, you want to copy that file path and actually plug it in into Power BI because it's going to be looking for a home directory for R. And that's basically the location where all the R libraries and code is stored. So that way Power BI can easily recognize the libraries that you have installed on your machine. Okay? That um, how to install R link here also walks you through that. So in case you're confused by what I'm saying, go to this link. It'll guide you through placing that here.
Okay. All right, so I'm gonna hit cancel. I've already done those things. So what we're gonna do next then is I'm gonna go connect to my data. So I'm gonna go up to get data. I'm connecting to an Excel file here. I just showed you a moment ago, actually it's a CSV file. And I'm gonna select the European stock market and hit okay or open. I'm gonna take this into the query editor. So I'll hit edit. And what I'd like to do is we're gonna use a little bit of an R script to be able to replace that value, the missing values here. And I, here's my code that I'm using. We're gonna replace these values for the 15th and the 20th and so on and so forth using this little bit of code right here. The part I have highlighted is what we're gonna use inside of Power BI. Now there's a portion up at the top here as well. This portion I have up in the top of my, my little script is to install a library that I don't have already. There's this library in here called Mice, and basically what that's used for, that library is used for detecting missing values like we're trying to accomplish here. So before I can actually use this bottom portion of the script, I need to make sure that that library is installed in my R instance. Here's how you do that. There's a, a couple ways. You can either launch the RStudio if you downloaded that separately, or if you just did the one simple install I showed you a few moments ago, you can launch open the Microsoft, apparently my cap lock is on, Microsoft uh, R, and you can launch the Microsoft R open client interface here. And all you have to do is run this little script here to install the components that are needed for the library to do this missing values example. So I would say install packages, and then I would tell it that the name of the package is mice, hit enter, and it's now gonna install this library of code that I can use inside of R. So if there's a lot of code that doesn't come by default with R, but you can do one little script like that to install it and start to use it in your examples like what I'm doing here today. So that installed all the components I need just with that one little line of code that installed.packages mice. And now what I can do is I can go back over to Power BI I'm gonna copy this bottom part of the code, and we're going to do a new transform by going up to the transform section here. And you'll see up underneath the transform ribbon, way, way on the far right, there's this option here called run R script. Okay, so I can select that run R script, and all I have to do is paste in my code, like so. And so let, let me briefly tell you what this R script is doing. It's calling the library that we just oops sorry. It's calling the library that we just installed a few moments ago. So it's calling that library called mice. It's then checking against the value that we have for the completed values that we have, which are the uh, SMI missing columns, or missing values I should say. And it's going to create a new column, a new output here called completed values. So it's doing a detection across the output that we do have, and it's going to create two new outputs. One that has the data set replace the values altogether, and then another output where it's gonna give me the option to keep the original values and see the new values next to it. All right, you'll also notice down here in the bottom that it says the current home directory is this one. This is the one that I had to set up prior to our working with us today. All right, so I'll hit okay. And give that a few moments, there we go. And so I told you it was gonna produce two different outputs. And I see two different outputs that are shown here for me. One that has the completed values and another one here called output. Again, the difference between the two, the top one here, let me uh, show that. The top one here actually went ahead and replaced the values right away. So you can see on day 15 here, for example, I now have a value where I didn't before. So this, this uh, little R script replaced the value that was missing and plugged it in where I had missing values. How do I know that was the one that was missing? Well, I remember it, but plus also I can look at the other data set here, the one called output. And if I look at the one called output, you'll see if I expand this a little bit more, you can see that it gives me a side-by-side -side comparison of the ones that did have values and the ones that have been plugged in as new values that is replaced. So it's actually detected those values for me, running an algorithm, so that I'm getting some questions on how's it doing this? Well, it's running an algorithm behind the scenes to detect those missing values. This is actually a similar function to what you'll find in uh, some Excel data mining add-ins as well, if you've ever played around with those. All right, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna take both the new values and the old values, and here's how I'm gonna do that. I can click on this table option right here. If I click on that, it'll actually expand and make my data set return back what I see on the bottom. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on table. Okay, and give that a few moments, there we go. And so now I see both that, that data set now being brought to the forefront, the output is showing the number of days, 
the missing values, you can see that it has also given me completed values for where those missing values are. Okay, but all by running this little R script that ran an algorithm to determine what those missing values should have been. Okay, all right, cool. So let's move on. So the next thing that we're going to do with this then is we're going to visualize it real quick. How about that? So I'm going to go ahead and hit uh, close and apply. And we'll build a quick little chart. Let's say that we want to build a, a little cluster column chart here. So I'll build a cluster column chart. And in this chart, we want to see the missing values next to the completed values. Okay, as you would expect, the completed values is higher than the missing values. And then I want to see the days on the axes. Okay, so here's kind of what it looks like initially. So obviously there's too much going on here. So what maybe I want to do is I want to just filter it down to uh, the first 50 days. And so if I want to filter this down, I can come down to my filter section here and let's apply a filter on the day. And let's say that I want to filter this to see all the days that are greater than 50. Uh, let's say between, maybe let's do a between here. Maybe I'll say all the days that are uh, greater than zero and less than 50, less than or equal to 50. All right, so I'll hit okay or apply filters down those data set, and here it's a little bit easier to see now. Now you can pretty clearly see where I have missing values. So there's the 15th, there's my next day that I have missing values, and I can see that's actually the 20th, the 29th, and so I can kind of get a good picture here of where all those missing values are, and I can compare, and I can actually go validate now. Uh, I plugged in a value, but maybe I want to go validate what the value really should have been, and I can kind of do that. Now, of course, what I might want to do here is if I'm really trying to just analyze this and assume those missing values uh, the completed values are really the ones I want to have. Then I can ditch the missing values here, get rid of that, and maybe make this into something like a line chart so I can kind of see the clear values return back. Okay? All right. Cool. So that's one example of how R can work. Now, this one is actually kind of truly using some algorithms behind the scenes to, to, to find those missing values. But you can also do some other things that are really interesting with R that have to do with data cleansing. And so this example was nice, but let's show another one. And this next one that I want to show you, we're actually going to use R to do something that's pretty fantastic. Uh, what we're going to do in this next example is I'm going to go get some data from a zip file stored on the web, and I'm going to bring the data from that zip file into Power BI. So I told you there's three different ways that you can use R inside of Power BI. One was using it as a transform. That's what we just did. Another way is using it in data visualizations, which we're going to do a little bit later. The other way, the third way that I'm going to show you now is that you can actually bring in and import data and using R, an R script as a source. So you'll actually see if you go to the get data section up here in the top that you have an option for an R script to be a data source right here. So let's walk you through that a little bit. And the example that I have here that we're going to do next is I have a zip file. Okay, and in that zip file, here's the little code that I'm going to talk you through here in just a moment. In that zip file, which by the way, you're welcome to share. I'll, I'll uh, put this on the screen so you can see it. And I know that's kind of a nasty little URL there. But basically what's inside of this uh, zip file is it has a couple files in it. And I'm going to, what I would like to happen is I want the, the company that updates this file, which by the way, it's Pragmatic Works file, but I want the company that updates the zip file on a regular basis to continue updating it. I don't want to have to download the zip file, unzip it, and then bring it into Power BI. I want to connect to the live version of the zip file, and anytime I go to refresh my Power BI uh, connector, I want it to go get a refreshed version of what that data, what's stored in that data set. And what's stored in that data set, if I were to go ahead and download that, is a pretty simple little set of files. There's only two files in here. But here's what you see. I have two files in here. One that has in it the file called master.csv, which is a master file of all baseball players from very early on. And then another one here called teams. And inside this teams file, if I open up the teams file from the zip file I just got off the web, it has a bunch of information about baseball teams. We got baseball season starting soon. I'm not sure how many of you guys are baseball fans. I am one, and so I wanted to try and see if I can pull in this data that's stored inside the zip file and bring it into Power BI and start to analyze it. So here's what I'm going to do. If I want to be able to bring in this data, there's a couple ways you can do it, by the way. You don't have to use R to do this. There's some ways with inside of the, R, the uh, mQuery language as well where you can, you can do this. 
but I really wanted to show you some of the capabilities of R. So what we're going to do in this one is I'm going to uh, ditch this for a moment, and we're going to go up to the Get Data section, and I'm going to select More, and we're going to do an R script source. And you'll find underneath others, you can find R scripts right here as well. And I'll hit connect. Now, before we go too far on the Power BI side, what I'd like to do is I'm going to launch open R Studio and show you, show you really how you can test this out. And I want to show you what the code looks like so you're kind of familiar with it before we go too far and to just jumping through all these examples here. So real quickly, I'm going to open up R Studio. Okay. And here's what my file looks like, my script looks like, I should say. Basically, what we're doing here is we're creating a temp location for this file. So we're, we have a zip file. We're going to create a temp spot for it, basically. And, and once we have that temp spot created, which is what's done right here, it creates a little temporary location for a file. Then we're going to go download the file. And there's there's a lot of usage of like uh, variables in here, or what appear to be variables in here. So in this case, we're creating a temp location for a file. Then we're creating and storing in this location called uh, URL zip file the location of where the zip file is that we want to download. Okay, so that's the zip file that we want to download. Then we actually execute an R script that does the download. So download.file calling this location. So this URL zip location is calling what you see right here. And it's storing it in that temp location that we defined up here. Okay, so that kind of ties in those, those first three lines of code. Then below that, we're trying to unzip that zip file. So UNZ is one version of an unzip script in R. There's also, you can also actually fully write out unzip is another way of writing unzip inside of Power BI, I'm sorry, uh, R. But UNZ is one method of doing it. And basically what we're saying is we want to unzip the file that's stored in the temp location and we want to read in this file called teams.csv from that zip file. So we're storing that CSV file in this variable called CSV file, okay? Then right below that, we're reading in that CSV file. You can see the correlation here. This is tying into that. And then we're outputting it into a data screen here or a, a data frame called Teams. So we're able to actually view this information in here. And then the stuff on the bottom just kind of cleans up all the temporary uh, items that we've created. Okay, that's all the stuff on the gar bottom here is just garbage to clean everything up once we're done. So if I were to execute this inside of our studio, here's what happens. If I hit uh, run, or if I hit source up in the top right, that runs the script. It's going to download my zip file, and it creates a data frame here for me where I can actually view the data inside of that file. So this is viewing inside of our studio. We're now viewing what is inside of that zip file. Even though it's still kind of located out there, we downloaded a temporary version of it with inside of the script that we have, and we're viewing what's inside of the, the teams.csv. Okay, so it, it, it does download it though, so be, be certain of that. So what we can do now is we can take the script that we just created or that I brought in here and kind of explained. We can take that script and we can now bring it into Power BI. We'll leave every little bit of it that you see here. And even the cleanup steps because it's cleaned up that zip file it created already. It's already downloaded, created the uh, local zip, our local version of the data, and it's already destroyed it. But what we want to do is we're going to go back over to Power BI. And we're going to plug in to the R script data source. And again, how I got here was I went underneath the get data section. And then underneath other, you'll find R script. And all you have is a, basically a, a blank empty screen here where you can paste in your code. So that's why oftentimes people like to use things like R Studio to be able to actually see and work with the code a little bit better. R Studio has things like IntelliSense built into it. So R Studio is a little bit easier to work with than this basically empty screen that we have here. So if I were to paste in that code that we have, and we already kind of reviewed it, so I'm not going to review it again, and hit OK, notice what happens with inside of Power BI. It does the same thing that we saw inside of R Studio. It actually presents it inside the Navigator pane just as if it were a table. And so I can select the Teams table here. Oh, by the way, one thing I should mention that I struggled with, that took me a long time to figure out. This is case sensitive inside of R Studio. So make sure if it's a capital T on the file that you do a capital T here for the, the file name. That, uh, that took me a while to figure out what I was doing wrong. It was actually, uh, I had a lowercase t when the file name had an uppercase t. All right, but I've got in here the Teams file, and I can hit uh, edit or load if I want to, and I can actually bring this now into Power BI and start to visualize this a little bit. So let's go ahead and hit load. I don't need to do any more editing to this. And let's build a quick little report here and take a look at some of the data that we have. 
So we can see here, let me delete this guy. We don't need this one anymore. We're just looking at the team's data now. So what I'd like to do though is I want to be able to build a little bit of a data visualization here. So maybe we want to do something like a scatter plot or scatter chart. And so I'll make this a little larger and maybe we want to see something like show me the, uh, the different franchises. Okay, and I'll put the franchises on the legend section here. And I want to see the home runs, so the number of home runs that uh, each team is hitting. And I want to see how many wins the teams are having. So I'm trying to see, is there some kind of correlation between home runs and wins and um, the number of runs that they score? So I'm going to bring in uh, wins and also runs. Okay. So I'm building out a nice little chart here. And of course, if you've worked with a scatter before, you realize that you can add a play axis to this as well. So I could add year down in the play axis if I wanted to. And I can actually animate this across time if I wanted to. So check this out. With something that we just pulled in, I can already have a pretty nice way of visualizing this where I can see the data across time and I can select each of the teams or the franchises up top here if I wanted to. So we've got a decent looking little visual here. Now you'll notice that we're, we have data all the way out to the 1800s here. So we may want to apply some kind of filter to this. Uh, maybe we filter this just to show the last uh, 10 or 15 years worth of data. Maybe everything that's greater than, let's say everything greater than or equal to the year 2000. There we go. So we can kind of apply that here. Now you can see whenever I start this now, it starts in the year 2000. So we can kind of interact with this and get a nice way to be able to visualize uh, this as well. So we've got a nice chart here, but maybe I'm trying to analyze it again. I'm trying to figure out, does, does home runs correlate to wins? If you hit a lot of home runs, are you going to have a lot of wins? And maybe I'm also trying to analyze a trend. Or have, have home runs been more frequent over the last few years? I think many of us probably know the answer to that is yes. But I can build out something like that, and I can say, let's build out maybe just a quick little line chart over here where I want to be able to visualize uh, home runs by years. So I can bring in and let's visualize home runs like so across time. So we're able to build out a nice little visual. You can see very clearly it looks like there has been, over time, pretty big spikes in the number of home runs that, are hitting, that were hit, especially in the late 90s to 2000s. A lot more home runs have been hit across time. So this is interesting. We're actually going to use a similar version of this report a little bit later when we're going to start to analyze things and show you how you can do things like, um, the, how you can start to use things like the analytics pane that you have here. Okay? But the purpose of this demonstration will show you how you can use the R scripting language as a data source. We actually used and went up to the get data section here. And underneath get data, we were able to define an R script to import our data and then eventually visualize it as we did here. All right. The last thing that I want to show you guys in this example, or in this uh, uh, data visualization, or I should say uh, query editing portion of our class today, is the ability to look at something that's brand new. This is a feature that I'm going to show you next is one that just came out yesterday. So what I want to do to show you this example, and this is one that you can certainly follow along with if you'd like, because I'm going to launch a web browser to go get our data. So if you want to follow along, you can launch a web browser, and then you're going to go to this website called um, uh, explore.data.gov. And if you go to that website with me, it'll redirect. You can go somewhere else if you wanted to. Um, Howard, you're certainly right. The data wasn't perfect there. I, I, I would need to do some things like, uh, Howard, you are, you are a very anal analytical mind. I like your thinking there. He's, he's going to get me uh, set straight there on my, my uh, baseball data set. But you're right. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to explore.data.gov. Uh, I, just, I, I just launched a web, regular web browser, Steve. So it could be, uh, I, I just launched Chrome or um, Edge or Internet Explorer, whatever you want, Firefox. But I'm going to go to explore.data.gov, and the data set that I'm looking for here is called FDIC Failed Banks. Now, if you've sat with me through a class before or some webinars before, you've probably seen me use this data set before. I'm going to use it a little bit differently today. So I'm going to go to FDIC Failed Banks and do a search here. And the data set that we're looking for here is this one here called FDIC Failed Bank List, and I'll go ahead and select that. And the data set you'll find right here is a comma separated file, a CSV file that we can use. Uh, now, the nice thing about how Power BI works, you might have seen this before in other demonstrations, is I don't necessarily have to download this CSV file. I can leave it here. We saw the same thing a few moments ago with the way that we defined the R script. 
Um, the R script actually downloaded the file kind of internally, but in this scenario, rather than downloading the CSV file, what I'd like to do is leave the file there so if any, in case anyone updates it, I can get those updates. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it so that rather than downloading it, I'm going to get a link to where that file is stored. So to do that, we would right-click on download here, select copy link address, and it's just getting a link to where that file is stored rather than downloading it. I'm now going to take that link over to Power BI, and I've launched a couple instances of Power BI here. Let me use this fresh one here. So I'm going to use a completely fresh instance. This example doesn't uh, require you to follow along with anything else I've done. And so what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to go up to Get Data, and we're going to say that we're pulling data in from the web. And by the way, this does require that you have installed the new version of Power BI that came out yesterday. So I did kind of mention you may want to go install that. So I'll select web, and I'm going to paste in the link for the file that we just looked at a few moments ago, the FDIC failed bank list. I'll hit OK. It's then going to bring me into the query editor. It's actually going to bring me to the, the uh, a little confirmation screen here first, and we'll select edit in the bottom to go to the query editor. Okay, and I want to show you how this new feature works. It's a really, really, really cool new feature. It's called Add Column from Example, and basically how it works is it allows you to type an example of what you want the result to look like, and based on that typing, it will actually uh, create M queries behind the scenes for you, and it'll create transforms automatically for you. So this data set's pretty simple. It has uh, five, you know, six or seven columns in it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is we're going to start to create some new columns based off of these existing columns. All right, so let me show you what I mean by that. Up in the top ribbon, you'll see there's an Add Column section here. You're going to go underneath Add Column. And this new feature, like I said, it was just released yesterday. So if you haven't downloaded Power BI Desktop since yesterday, you don't have this. But this new feature that I'm going to show you is this one here called, oop, got something's covering it up, sorry. It's called Column from Example. New, re newly released yesterday. And uh, basically what this allows you to do is to type values and see the results of those values turned into transforms automatically for you. Now when you hit the down arrow, you see there's two options. You can either create these new columns based on you selecting one particular column, or you can base it off of all the columns. For this first example, let's say that we wanna create columns from example based on all the columns, and then I'll show you why you might in some cases wanna do it based on the selection of columns in a few moments. But we're going to start with from all columns. Now when you do that, you'll notice what happens is on the right-hand side, it has this new column it's trying to create, but it, you'll see there's a little cursor in here where you can start to type values in. And so how this works is you can do things like you can type the city name. So you can do something like this. You can start to type in Cottonwood Heights. Let's say we want to see Cottonwood Heights, comma, UT for Utah. And if I hit enter, look what happens. By me typing in the city, comma, state, it's now duplicated that all the way down for all the values that I have, and notice up top here that it's actually converted what I typed, the English words I typed, into an mQuery transform behind the scenes for me. So this is a really, really, really cool new feature, and if I, all I have to do is hit uh, uh, Control Enter or hit OK here, and it'll create that new column for me that does the combination of those two values for, the really those three values for me. So then I would, of course, want to rename this column, so I'll call this something like City State. I can see you guys really like this. Um, so uh, David asked a question to, you know, how does this impact query folding? In this case, it's going to be hard to be able to show that because I'm connected to a, a web CSV file. But in, uh, depending on how it writes the M query, it, query folding could still apply. In this case, the way that it wrote the M query, if we go back to actually look at it up top here, uh, let's see, where is it at? It is right here. If I go back to look at how it wrote the M query, there's not really any reason why it wouldn't be able to uh, do that in, in query folding. So it's, it's an interesting way to be able to uh, combine data very easily. Okay. All right. So uh, someone said, can I show that again? I'll tell you what, I'll show you through another example. But let, let me first go ahead and make sure I rename this. I'm going to call this city state. So let's, uh, oh, I, I already did rename it. I renamed it down here. There we go. Okay, so let's do another example. Let's show you how else we can use this cool new feature. Uh, the way that this works this time, let's say that I want to manipulate my dates. And you'll notice here that I have two different dates, okay? I have closing date and I have updated date. 
Now I could of course remove the one I don't want, but let's say maybe I want both these dates. And I'd like to use this new column from, from example to be able to parse out the date. Okay, so for example, I want to return back a column that says March, uh, that says 3rd, that says 2017, all as separate columns in here. And so rather than me doing this uh, option that we saw a few moments ago, rather than me telling it that I want to do it based off of all the columns, I'm going to instead first select the closing date. So I'll select the closing date column first. If you're following along, select closing date with me. And then go back up to the columns from example and select from selection. You don't want to do it from all columns because if I start to type March, it's not going to be sure which column am I trying to pull it from. Am I trying to pull it from the updated date or the closing date? So because I've selected closing date, I can select from selection. It's going to give me that same interface we saw a few moments ago. And then check this out. Now what I can do is I can type something like March here. Hit enter. And you'll notice what it's doing is it's parsing out from my closing date column the month name. So it's got March, January, January, September, August, May, and it's parsing it from the date here. So I can hit OK. Creates a new column here for me that has the month name. So I can call this one month. And let's do it a couple more times. Let's again, let's select the closing date column again, and I'm going to tell it that I want to populate from a selection again. So a new column from a selection. And this time, let's do it for year. So I'll type in 2017. You'll notice here that it looks like it has done that properly. It's parsing out. You can see as soon as it switches to 2017, so does my new value on the, the right. So that appears to be working. So I can hit OK. Let's rename this year as well. And behind the scenes, it's doing all these transforms for me automatically. All these transforms are being done. I'm not having to write a lot of M query. I'm just kind of typing out what I think the data should look like, and it's producing for me. Um, it gets better, guys. If you got, I see a lot of comments that you guys like this. It's, it just, guess what? It's about to get way better. Um, all right, so let me do one more here. I'm going to do one more. I'm going to select the closing date one more time. Select populate from selection again. And this time I want to get the date. So I'm going to put in the number three. And look here. All I had to do was type the number, tw the number three. And look, it's got 27, 13, 23. It's pulling back the date. So it's doing a pretty good job there. Jennifer asked the question, can I do, can I kind of parse it in the year month format? You certainly can. So if I were to format it and start typing in the year here, for example, and say um, 03, oh, maybe I hit a roadblock there. Oh, it's probably because I did the 03. Let's try to get the year first. And then let's see if we can add in the dash three at least. Will that work? Ah, uh, you found, Jennifer, you found a roadblock there. Now what I can do certainly is I could parse them out separately and then bring them together just with a simple combine of the columns. But um, there's definitely some interesting ways that you can kind of work with it. But here's what I want to do for this example, to finish this example that I'm focused on. I'm going to bring back the day of the month. I'll rename this one day. I'll hit OK. All right. And then here's the, here's the grand finale here. Are you guys ready for this? This is the really cool part. So I'm going to do it one more time, but this time, rather than basing the column from example of a certain selection, I'm going to base it off of all columns again. So I'm going to come up to the top here, and then I'm going to type in and say I want to bring back from all columns. Now check this out. This is the mind-blowing part. I've seen a couple mind blow. Here's, here's where it gets really cool. I can start to type a lot of things in here. So say, for example, I want to see um, the name of the bank here. If I scroll over... The name of the bank was Proficio Bank. Okay, so I can say the name of the bank, and I can say was acquired by Cash Valley Bank in Cottonwood Heights, Utah on March third 2017 you ready for this hit enter it just did that for every single one of the values here so I wrote this big long sentence and now it's created that big long sentence and converted it for every single one of the examples I had don't believe me all right let's check this out so I'll hit OK here let me rename this let's call this the description okay so you can check out and see exactly what was created for each of these so I wrote it one time, it did it for everything. So I can see the Woodbury Banking Company was acquired by United Bank in Woodbury, Georgia on August 19th, 2016. So it's actually done this now for every one of my values in here. So here's what I can do with this next. I can hit uh, close and apply. 
And what I can do is I can build some visual on this. So maybe what I want to do now that I've got this looking pretty good, I can, and by the way, there's certainly some flaws with this, just so you guys know. Uh, I, I already uncovered one here as you guys were asking if I can do this, if I can do that. Uh, there's certainly some flaws with it. I, I spent some time trying to perfect this example so it would look really pretty for you guys, but you'll run into some things that you're like, well, why, I would think that would work. Why didn't that work? So there might be some things that you try where you type out some stuff and it just doesn't do what you anticipate it does. I, I kind of staged a good example for to make it look pretty. So I don't work for Microsoft. I'll tell you when some things don't work just as I anticipate they would. But here's what I can do now is I can maybe build out a nice little visual here. So let's say that we want to put this into a map. Let's put city-state into that map. Okay, I'll make this a little larger. And then maybe what we'll also do is uh, I want to make the count of failed banks be represented by the size of the bubbles. So we'll have a count of failed banks be the size of the bubbles here. And then I'll also bring in on the right-hand side, let's bring in a uh, new matrix here. And let's put in the description. Okay, so I'm just kind of setting the stage here. Uh, this is a new matrix, by the way, that's still in preview. Remember I showed you how to turn on preview features a few moments ago? This new matrix, this matrix preview, has a few things that you can't do in the regular matrix, and it's separate from the regular matrix. Uh, one of the things that you can do with it is you can actually select items, and it can filter. You can't regularly filter based on a matrix in the other matrix. So this is a new type of matrix. Uh, the other thing you can do in this matrix that you can't really do very easily elsewhere is you can do word wrapping. So I can tell it I want to word wrap this. So that way, as I make things, make the column smaller, Let's see, I'm trying to find the column header up here. Let me find a individual city here that we can filter down. Let's find Jacksonville or near Jacksonville. So let's also increase the size of this um, text size. There we go. All right, so what I can do now, though, is I can, oh, you know what? The word wrapping is actually somewhere different. It is... There we go, there's word wrapping. So now what I can do though is I can go underneath and find a particular city that I want to analyze and maybe I want to see, all right, well it looks like there was two failed banks here in Jacksonville, Florida. I can select that and then I can get the description on those two failed banks here. So pretty cool, pretty cool way to analyze this, bring it all together. Uh, you can add some padding in between this if you wanted to. So if you wanted to be able to make it a little bit easier to differentiate the difference between these two, I could do something like this. I could go underneath the grid section of the matrix and I could increase um, word padding in here uh, underneath the section here called row padding right here. There we go. So now it's a little easier to differentiate each of these. So very cool new feature. That's something you can play with now that was just released yesterday is the uh, uh, create from, from example, basically. Okay. Very cool. All right. So tell you what, let's move on. We got, um, it's time for break. Let's go ahead and take our break and then we'll come back and we'll keep going. Sounds like you guys like that last example. That's a good way to end. Uh, just a reminder if, for folks that have logged in recently, if you're just logging in, I uh, do want to let you know about a promo that we're doing for those that are attending our uh, virtual workshop today. Uh, you can get 20% off of our Power BI pack, which is an inclusion of five different courses, and you would have access to it for a year. Uh, that Power BI pack includes Power BI desktops and dashboards, uh, Power BI, two Power BI Excel courses. Uh, it also includes a Power BI custom visuals course, which we're constantly adding to because they constantly change it. And then also it includes an introduction to a DAX course. So if you're interested in learning more about DAX, we, that was just released last week. One thing I should also mention about our training is we do update it very, very, very frequently. You'll see when it comes to our training, we kind of stand our, have ourselves set apart from others because we actually update ours. You'll find a lot of the stuff you find out there for free was put out there about a year and a half ago. And if you know anything about Power BI, they change every month. So it's important to have something that can actually keep up to date with the product. And uh, we, we do that. So uh, you can certainly sign up for a trial, but you can also uh, purchase if you go to our website and use the promo code Power BI Pack. That'll get you 20% off of our pack of five different Power BI courses for a year. So uh, go ahead and plug in any kind of questions you guys have during the five minute break here. I'll try and address as many of them as I can. Uh, and then as we come back, we'll kind of finish up on some data visualization stuff and uh, a few other things. All right, see you guys in a few minutes.
All right, guys, we'll come back here quickly. Uh, so a lot of questions on the, I, I did a quick little pitch there at the end about um, the Power BI pack that we have, the, the training that we have. Um, if you buy the Power BI pack and uh, we make updates, you do get those updates throughout the, the course of the year that you have it. And if you renew, of course, you get more updates. Um, and any new classes that we add to the Power BI pack, we actually added the Introduction to DAX course that I mentioned uh, right before break. We added that to the Power BI pack. It was not included with it. Uh, but DAX obviously makes sense to be part of Power BI, so we added it into that pack. So, And we didn't change the price at all, so we just added more value to it. I uh, got a question here about, is the session recorded? Uh, it certainly is. You'll probably see that posted, Steve, and others uh, within, before the end of the week. So you'll see before the end of the week the recorded version of this. And let me see if there's any other quick questions I can do. Uh, so Robert had a good point here. He said he, th he thinks that the, um, the date that I was trying to do, when I was trying to parse out the date in the uh, column from example didn't work because three was also the 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 day as well. That's that's certainly possible. You're probably right about that. Um, David asked about kind of my, do you have the text for the zip? Um, tell you what, I'll put this in the chat so everybody can have. I don't typically share out the, the all the files. What I will do is the marketing team will share out the, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, not that I'm using the PowerPoint slides a ton, but a lot of the materials here that I'm showing today we actually have through, through paid training that we do, so I probably won't share all the, the data files and things like that, uh, just so you're aware, uh, but we do share the, the PowerPoint. I don't have a problem, any problems sharing the PowerPoint. Uh, let's see, any other question? Mind blown. Geez, wow, that's a, good, a, lot, of, a lot of good comments on, on the, uh, the last piece we showed right before break. Try to see if there's any quick questions I can do before we move forward here. And by the way, one of the things that we try and do as well is um, we try and take questions, a lot of good comments on the, the stuff we showed so far, good. Uh, we try and take the questions and we'll actually uh, write a blog post about it, a follow-up blog post, uh, so that way you'll be able to um, have it as well. So some per somebody said they don't see the, the DAX course in our Power BI pack. You should see it if you go to our Power BI pack, if you go to our website and um, under our website, if you search for really uh, uh, live training or on-demand training here, underneath on-demand training, and we'll get right back to new content here in a moment. If you go underneath uh, Power BI Pack, which includes five courses, if you select more info, you should see there are the five courses listed there. Um, where, where can you find the recording? The recording will be sent to you guys uh, right as it's available. It'll actually get emailed to you, but you'll also find it on our website. All right, cool, and then one last question. Someone asked a technical question here. Let me get back to the technical question. By the way, there's the introduction to DAX. Uh, the technical question was, how did I do the word wrapping? So word wrapping is actually a new feature, <clears throat> a part of the special new matrix. So the special new matrix was actually released in last month's Power BI release, and it is a preview feature. So if you wanna be able to use this, you actually have to go underneath view and options, and options here again. And then underneath the options here, you'll find underneath the preview features, there is a new matrix visual right here. You'll have to turn this on to be able to use it. Uh, once you turn that on, you can actually have the ability to do some of the word wrapping stuff I'm showing. The word wrapping capabilities that I did, this is again, this is on a ma the new matrix. And so you'll see I actually have two matrix here. I have this one and this one. This one's the old one. This one's the new one. That's a preview feature. And so what you can do, if you use the new matrix, you can select it, and then to your question, you can go underneath the format paintbrush, and then what I did was I changed the row header section, and I made the row header section word wrap. There's a option in here, right here, called word wrap, and if you turn that on, or let me show you, if I turn it off, for example, if I turn it off, you can see it all just kind of puts it on one line, but if I turn it back on, it makes it wrap. Uh, I also put some row padding in there as well, so padding kind of made it so that there was a little bit of a, a space between each of the values. All right, good deal. So well, let's go ahead and move on. we got a lot more to cover and uh, only an hour, less than an hour left here. So I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to cover some of the other items on our list today. And I also have some other new things I would like would like to show you guys as we get into some of our later examples here. One of them that someone brought up in chat earlier is a new feature. I wouldn't particularly call this advanced, but it is a new feature that I'd like to like to show you guys. Uh, this newer feature that came out just yesterday 
is uh, called Quick Measures, okay? And again, I don't think this is advanced. If anything, it probably makes things easier for people. But I would like to get you a peek at this because it drew a question that someone had earlier is, you know, is there still a need to learn DAX? And I certainly think there is, even with this new feature, because you'll find that some of the DAX that it writes for you isn't perfect. In fact, some of it that it writes for you is overly complex, more complex than it really needs to be. So let's take a look at how this new feature works, and then we'll kind of talk through uh, another uh, subset of features that go along with it. So the uh, example that we're going to show here, let me actually open up a partially set up, ready to go example here. I'm going to open up a, um, a file that has already got me partially set up here. And I'm going to close this one out. Okay. All right, so I have a data set here that's already got some uh, tables built into it. And uh, what I want to show you through this example here is we'll build a couple quick tables. So tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and bring in that new matrix that we just talked about a few moments ago. And I'm going to place on that matrix, I'm going to put the sales territory group like so. And uh, let's also do something like put the countries on rows like so. Oop, did I get it? Nope, countries need to go switch those around. There we go. And so I'm trying to build out a little table here. We obviously want to increase the text size of that. You can do that by going underneath the format paintbrush section here and bumping up the text size a little bit. So now we can actually see that. All right, good. So what I want to do and show you in this one is how you can actually build on some of your own calculations, your DAX calculations, without necessarily having to learn DAX. This is a new feature that's just come out, and it does have 19 upon its release. There's probably going to be more added to it. But it has 19 DAX calculations, some of them that are fairly complex, uh, built into it. So that way you can easily add new DAX into your model. And this is uh, definitely targeted for those that are maybe more analysts that don't have that Excel background, Excel formula background that DAX is maybe new to them. This gives them some guidance and actually creates a lot of the formulas for them. There are some catches to it. I'll talk about those as we go through this, but let's go ahead and walk you through how this works. And uh, to do that, I'm going to start by bringing in the sales amount into our design. So I'm going to bring in sales amount into our table here, our matrix. And then what I'd like to do, now that I have sales amount and I have the sales territory group and country, I'm going to build some analysis here so that way I can start to determine um, really some uh, capabilities, like I want to be able to see like percent of total and percent of column total and that sort of thing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by selecting the option here where you see sales amount. So right here, sales amount, you'll see there's a little drop down next to sales amount. And from that drop down, there's, there's two things that we're going to talk about here. There's one here called show values as, or show value as, and there's a second one here called quick measures. These are new. These are things that were just released yesterday, okay? And uh, one of them, by the way, show value as, is uh, really a replacement for quick calcs. If you used quick calcs in the past, show value as is a replacement for that. So just be aware of that, that if you don't see quick calcs anymore, that's because show value as is a replacement for that. And they've done some enhancements to that here as well. So what we're going to do to be able to really look at this is we're going to bring in and look at um, a percent, a percent of grand total and a percent of column total, which you will find by going underneath the show value as. And again, how I got here, let me show you how I got here again. I selected the matrix. I went over to the section here where all my fields are, the field list, or the field well. And I selected the down arrow next to sales amount. And then you'll see there's two options, quick measures, which we'll talk about here in a moment, and show value as. When you select show value as, you have the ability to kind of quickly create calculations. You'll see things like percent of grand total. So I can select percent of grand total here. Okay, and it gives me a percent of the grand total. I can also go, come back in here and add sales amount again. So if I drag sales amount in again, and I can look at something like a percent of the column total. So if I change this to percent of column total this time, I'm able to kind of analyze and see, okay, well, it looks like France had 9% uh, of the overall total, but it had 29% of the European total here. I can look at uh, United States. United States had 31.98% of the grand total, but it had 82.6% of the column total, which is all the results in North America because there's Canada in here as well. So it's an interesting way to be able to build out some quick formulas. And these are kind of done on the fly. And again, how I did that was I dragged in an implicit measure here. 
and then I hit the down arrow next to it and told it that I wanted to do show value as, and I can do as columns, uh, column totals, brand totals, or row totals. And then I'm able to do that analysis in here of those values, okay? So that's kind of interesting. That's uh, It's helpful. It does add in that capability, but it only adds it for this matrix. It does not add it for any other visuals. If I want those type of formulas added for other visuals, then I need to be able to write some DAX. This is not writing DAX that you can actually see. It probably is doing it behind the scenes, but it's not creating any DAX here that I can actually see and evaluate and look at. If you want to create DAX that actually is sticky, meaning it stays and you can use it for other visuals, then we need to do something like write our own DAX or use this new feature called Quick Measures. So let me go to another uh, report page here to show you this one. And in this new report page, we're going to go ahead and bring in the new matrix again. And I'm going to resize this. And let's bring in something like the full date alternate key from our date table, so the, the, basically the date. I'm going to go find that out of my date table here, like so. And I'm going to increase the text size of this because that's entirely too small for you to see. There we go. It's a little bit better. And what I'd like to do now is build out and analyze the sales amount. So I can bring in sales amount here. By the way, you can, of course, search up here so I can type sales amount to find what I really care about. And that would help me find it a little faster. I can check off sales amount now. And so I can kind of analyze sales amount at uh, this level. I can also drill in. If I wanted to, I can drill down another level. Now I'm seeing the values at the next level. I can drill in another level down. I can see it down to the month level, and I can go one step further and see it all the way down to the day level. Now, the reason why I have this little hierarchy, if you remember, I dragged in the date column, but Power BI automatically converts dates when they're dragged into tables like this or uh, some charts as well. It converts it into a hierarchy, which you can see right here. Now, there is the ability to turn that off. If you don't want it to automatically convert it to a hierarchy, you can turn it off, but that's what it happens by default. So by default, it's going to create a hierarchy out of your date. And of course, you can go underneath the settings to turn this capability off. Um, in this case, though, I'm going to go ahead and keep it, but I will ditch quarter out of this. So I can see quarter right here. I'm going to hit the X next to quarter and just look at this at a year, month, and day level. Okay. I also want to kind of change this uh, new uh, uh, matrix and make it so that it's a little bit more indented. You'll notice that one of the things that's new about the matrix is it actually gives you kind of a stepped approach, but it's not really indented enough for me. So what I can do is I can go under the format paintbrush and underneath the format paintbrush find row headers and underneath row headers there's a section here called, let me expand it so you can see it, there's next, a section here called step layout identify, uh, indention, excuse me. And you can bump that up some if you wanted to, and notice what happens when I bump that up. It kind of uh, expands out the indention that you see here on the screen, so it kind of clearly differentiates each of those values that you have, okay? All right, so that's a nice way to kind of make it easier to see. All right, now the next thing I'd want to do here is I want to build out um, some new measures, and those new measures are going to be by using that quick measures uh, capability. So to do that, I'm going to go over to my field well here. I'm going to go find sales amount, which I have right here. And I'm going to expand or hit the down arrow next to sales amount, just like we did in our previous example. And this time, I'm going to use this quick measures option. So if I select quick measures, what this does is it launches a new dialog box here for me. And it gives me a list of all sorts of new measures that I have the ability to automatically add. So these are all DAX formulas that it's going to write for me. And if there's any parameters that need to go into the DAX, DAX formula, I can actually drag in fields that I want to place into those DAX formulas. Luckily, it actually uh, generally will automatically build out those DAX formulas for you and pass in values that you have in your matrix or table or whatever your visual is. So in this case, what I'd like to do is I want to see a month over month change. So how much did I change month over month? How much did I change from July to August or August to September, that sort of thing? I can select the month over month change. I can tell it what the value is that I'm trying to analyze month over month, which is a sum of sales amounts. That's correct. I can tell it the date that it's automatically picked up here for me. It's automatically picked up the full date alternate key. And then I can also tell it the periods that I want to analyze across. So if I don't want to just analyze over one month, I could actually make that across two months if I wanted to. Now, one thing to note is that you must use this nice date hierarchy here, which seems nice at least. You must use the date hierarchy if you want to be able to use formulas like this. If you, don't, if you have your own date hierarchy you created, um, it uh, supposedly does not work with your own date hierarchies. You actually have to use the one that comes with Power BI when you create and select a date field. So if I hit OK, 
okay? It's now created this month over month analysis. And let me roll up a little bit here so you can see it at a month level. So there was no values previous to July of 2005, so you don't see anything showing up here. Um, oh, so we got some people that have the latest version, but they don't see the quick measures. That might be another one of those features that's under the preview section here. Let me double check. Yeah, it is. So if you've just downloaded the latest Power BI, you'll need to go enable it as a preview feature. It's shown right here. If you go underneath the file menu and then select options, you'll find preview features and you can turn on quick measures. That's where it's at. So this is a feature that's coming soon. It's, it's released in preview. You can play with it now uh, if you downloaded the one from yesterday. But here I created this calculation and the good news about how this works is I can actually go look at that calculation that created. If I wanted to, I can go find the calculation. It actually does create a true DAX measure here. And I can see that DAX measure that's been created and I can select that DAX measure and see the code behind the scenes of what it's done. And it's written some fairly, uh, quite a bit of code here for me. It's actually even given you a little bit of a, uh, an if then else statement to deal with any errors that you might have. But it's written some code for you here to be able to deal with those errors and also to be able to handle that um, determining the difference between those two months. So it's giving me a percent difference between those two months based on the selection and the parameters that I fed into it whenever we did the uh, quick measures. Okay. So let me show you another example just so you can kind of get another view of how this works. I can go back over to select the matrix again. I can go find the sales amount once more. Okay, so if you didn't see this the first time, I'm gonna do it once more. You hit the down arrow next to sales amount. You can see sales amount month over month percent was automatically added because I was working with inside this matrix. I can hit the down arrow next to it and do quick measures again. And this time, let's say I wanna do something like a year to date. I can select year to date total here. It's kind of pre-populated this how I would want, but if for some reason I wanted to change something, I can actually come on the right-hand side and replace any of these values with values that I have in my model. Then I can hit OK. And it's created this new calculation, and I can see the results of that calculation showing up in my matrix. Okay, So this should be showing year-to-date, meaning that this is going to be a semi-additive measure. So I can see that these three values together should equal this. Okay. Uh, so, so question uh, plugged, I saw somebody plug in a question about how do I deal with fiscal calendars. It can certainly handle fiscal calendars, but it cannot do it within that UI that we just looked at. So this is a great question from the perspective of, well, you know, can I always just use that quick measures section to create all my DAX formulas? Here's a scenario where you can't use it. If you're using fis a fiscal calendar, then you'll actually need to come in and adjust the DAX that was written and in the adjustment of the DAX that was written, it uses a formula here called total YTD. Well, that total YTD DAX function has the ability for you to specify what your year end date is. So if your year end date isn't 12-31-2017, it's actually something like uh, the end of June or the end of July, whatever it may be, you can come into this formula and modify it. And so what I would do is I would come into this formula and I would add to it by adding a comma at the end here, I would add in what my year end is. And it can either be a hard-coded value or a value that you have in the table, but you would specify what your year end is, and then it's able to readjust what the year-to-date value should look like. So if you have a fiscal calendar, you can certainly use this still, but you would have to go make some manual adjustments in here uh, if, need, if that's the case. Okay, let me back that out. Good question. All right, let's show one more example of uh, this. And this is the, the next example I'm gonna show you is probably one of the most confusing things that people uh, struggle with when it comes to writing DAX. And it's this concept of called filter context. So if you're not really too familiar with what filter context is, don't worry too much about it for, for the time being. But I do want to try to give you an idea of how this can actually deal with filter context a little bit automatically for you. And so I'm gonna bring into this table, I'm gonna bring in my product name. And I'm also going to bring in uh, the sales amount. So let's go ahead and select sales amount again. Okay, right like that. I'll bump up the text size of this because that's entirely too small again. All right, there we go. And so what I'd like to do is I this time want to make it so that I can see 
not just the sales amount, but I want to see the sales amount for the United States. So how much did I sell not only of this product for all countries, but I want another column next to this that just shows me the U.S. sales for these products. And then maybe later on I'll do some division between the total sales and the U.S. sales so I can see the percent of sales for all of the United States. Now this is done, this, is, this concept is called filter context, and you would use a calculate formula to be able to do it. But if it's, it's, it's a fairly complex uh, formula if, you're, if it's new to you, and um, it's nice in that this new feature will actually write a calculate formula for you. So let me show you how this works. If I were to go back to the field well, hit the down arrow on sales amount again, and select quick measures. And this time what I'm going to do for my calculation is I'm going to select this option here called filtered value. And this is using that concept called filter context, so that way I can actually filter down to only return back U.S. sales as opposed to all sales. So I can select filter value here, and I can tell it that I want to filter sales amount, the sum of sales amount, but I want to filter the sum of sales amount based on another column. I don't want to filter it based off of the product name, so I'll take that out, but what I do want to filter it on is the country. And so what I would do in this case is I would remove the filter that was in there by default and I would go find underneath sales amount and I would drag in country underneath the filter section here. So now I'm going to return back sales amount filtered to be, to be a particular country sales amount. So then I can actually select underneath the select a value section here which country it is I want to filter. So they've made this UI very interactive. It even has a drop down where you, can, you don't have to type anything. It'll actually just return back a drop down where I can select United States instead of typing United States. Once I have that, I'll hit OK. It should add that here automatically for me, and you can see that it does indeed use a calculate formula here. And so basically how this formula works, it says that it's going to return back the sum of sales amount, but by using the calculate formula, it's going to return back the sum of the sales amount only when the value is United States inside the column called country. Okay, so that's how it's actually working. It's allowing you to write some of these formulas behind the scenes. It's writing all those formulas for you, but you can certainly come in and adjust them on your own if you needed to. Okay, so now I have a comparison. I can see the sum of sales amount for the United States versus the sum of sales amounts total. I might do some uh, division, maybe use a little divide function here to be able to uh, finish that off if I wanted to see percent of sales. Um, so a quick question here is how did, I, how did I see the formula? Well, it was automatically popping up for me, but if I want to go back and see the formula that it designed, I can go over to the field list on the right-hand side, and you can see it actually created these three calculations here for me. So if I just were to select one of those three calculations, it would bring up in the formula bar on the top, and I can look at the DAX that was written for me. Okay, so I can just select year-to-date, and it shows up on the top, or I can show, select uh, the last one that we did, and I can see it up top. All right, cool. So that's the, one of the new features. Now, I wouldn't say that's entirely complex, right? That's fairly easy to do, but it does show you how it's actually still important to know a little bit of DAX so you can know what it's doing. You need to be able to go in and read those formulas and adjust as needed because you guys even gave me a scenario just in us talking here where I might need to adjust and look at fiscal calendars versus regular calendar, and we were able to show you how to modify the DAX to do that if you needed to. Okay. All right. Cool, so let's move on to our next set of examples. So our next examples, and I know there's a ton of questions in here, but we're running out of time, and i got a lot to show you guys still, so I'm going to try and use uh, as much time as I can, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll try really hard to get a blog post out by the end of the week trying to answer many of these questions, but there are a lot of them. But what we're going to do in this last example is I'm actually going to bring open a uh, partially completed example. I'm going to open up my number 11 example here. My mouse will cooperate with me. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to open up my, mo my number 11 example here, and what I want to show you in this example is dealing with, uh, uh, kind of dealing with tooltips, and we're getting more into our data visualization side of the class, which we have devoted the last time for that. And I really want to show you quite a bit when it comes to data visualization, so I want to spend a lot of time on this area and get you guys a good view of what you can do in a more advanced manner when it comes to data visualizations. The first thing that I'm going to show you is actually related to DAX, and the DAX that we're going to write, there is no quick quick measures for this, uh, I'll promise you that, but the DAX that we're going to write isn't overly complex, but it is interesting, and, and I want to show you first and kind of set the stage of why we need this DAX. What we want to show you here first is uh, a basic, basic column chart here, nothing special about it. The column chart that we have here is returning back 
uh, total sales amount by country. And if you've worked with some of these column charts or really any of the data visualizations now, you probably know that you now have the ability to add in special fields as tooltips, even if they're not part of the uh, overall viewing of the chart. So what I mean by that is you'll, you see tooltips here, right? You can see when I hover above United States, it shows me sales territory country and sales amount. Those are the fields I have in the chart. But I can also add in other visuals or other measures to show into the tooltip section. So for example, if I wanted to see how, what the total quantity was that I sold, I can drag in select total quantity and place it into the measure section here. So that way I can, in addition to seeing sales amount, I can also see what the order quantity was. And so I can drag and drop order quantity underneath tooltip. And when I hover above this now, you can see the tooltip does show both the sales amount and the order quantity, even though order quantity isn't actually used to visualize the data. It's not part of the visual outside of the tooltip area. Now, the way I want to leverage this and the way I want to kind of show you the problem that we're trying to solve here is the problem that we're trying to solve is we really don't have the ability to add in um, attributes or va values that are more descriptive in nature. So what I mean by that is if I wanted to add as a tooltip over this, maybe I want to see the regions that are part of each of these, these countries. Well, I do have a region column here, and so my thought would be I would select the sales territory region, and I would drag and drop that into the tooltip section. Unfortunately, the only things that can be brought into a tool, the tooltip section are measures or uh, measure, measures that you've created. And so, for example, if I were to go drag and drop sales territory region in the tooltip area, notice what happens when I do the tooltip. You'll notice that it only returns back the first sales territory. Because what happens whenever you place things into that tooltip area, it assumes that you're trying to aggregate those values up in some way. So where it thinks that we're trying to aggregate up the sales territory up to the first or the last or whatever the, 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 the region is that it wants to show. And you can tell that because whenever I go to look at the tooltip area and hit the down arrow, you can see that it automatically forces itself into aggregating in some way. It's either going to do the first of it, the last of it, there's the last, it might do a count, there's the count. So I, you can see I have five regions in here. But what we want to do is we actually want to list each region. I want to see each region that is underneath the United States. Now, of course, I can drill into it if I wanted to, if I set the table up to do that or the column charts up to do that. But I want to see it on the tooltip itself. And the way to do that is by writing a little bit of DAX. Okay? The DAX I have for you is not overly complex. We're going to show a more complex example after I show you the basic one first. But it's a, it's a way of making a dynamic tooltip. Okay, so the code looks like this. Let me uh, uh, kind of bring up my example here and let's actually write a quick DAX formula. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to create a measure. It has to be a measure if we want to plug it in there and actually see it correctly. So I'm going to right click on the uh, DIM sales territory table here and I'm going to create a new measure. That's going to pop open the formula bar up at the top and I can start to write out my formula. And I've already kind of pre-written this because I knew we would be running short on time, so I want to make sure we can show as much as possible, but I will talk you through what this is doing. And basically what this formula is doing is it's creating a new measure called regions, and it's using filter context. Remember that calculate formula that we talked about before? It's actually using that and leveraging it in a way to concatenate all my regions together. So you can see that concatenate X function. The reason that concatenate X function is used is because it needs to do it across the context of a larger su subset of data. And so what it's doing is bringing back the regions and it's making them into a comma separated list is what it's doing here. That's what the concatenate X function is allowing us to do is set some kind of delimiter that we want to have within inside of that um, subsection of data there. Okay. So if I were to hit enter on this, okay, it will now create a new measure for me, which you can see over here called regions. And if I were to select and drop this into my tooltip now, I would see that it's now giving me a comma separated list of regions using that calculate and concatenate X function to be able to bring those together. By the way, this is actually an example from uh, an individual that used to work for Pragmatic Works, uh, Dustin Ryan, who works for Microsoft now. He has a, a couple good blogs on the ability to um, do the, kind of Power BI tips. He, he is, his blog is sqldusty.com. SQL Dusty, and uh, you'll find a lot of good tips that he has for Power BI there as well, and one of them was this tip. 
So he takes it one step further though. This is really where he takes it one step further. And what he says is, well, what if I have more than five regions? What if I have 25 regions underneath this? Do I wanna have a list of 25 values in a comma separated list? And his answer was, no, I don't wanna see 25 values. What I might wanna see is like three values. And then after those three values, give me some indication that there's more than this. And so what he did, which I thought was really interesting, was he wrote a formula, and I'll walk you through this as well, was he changed that formula, and in his version of the formula that I liked, was he did a quick count of how many regions there were, and if there was greater than or equal to three, then he's gonna run through this formula to not only concatenate the values, but if there's more than three, he doesn't wanna list all of those, he just wants to give you a kind of a dot, dot, dots, or an and more capability, letting you know that there's more. He just doesn't want to list them all in the tooltip because you don't want a list of 100 different regions here. I just want to see at least three, and if there's more than that, so be it. Show, show, let me know that there's more. So that's kind of what this formula is doing. It's getting a count of how many, distinct, how many regions there are, and based on that count, it has like a little bit conditional logic here. If there's more than three, then go through and actually give me that and, that and more that you see that's hard-coded right here. That's a hard-coded literal string that's passed in. If there's not more than three, then just kind of do what you would have done previously. So you would do the same thing that we did earlier. So let me show you what this one looks like. If I hit enter on this, here's the difference between the two this time. If I hover above it now, take a look at the difference. It'll show me at least three. So once we have three values, it's showing me northwest, northeast, central, and more. And that and more is because my formula told me that when there's more than three, then I needed to do that and more. If there's less than three, it's a conditional statement. If there's less than three, let's see, is there one that has two? I think, uh, where's one that has less than that? Well, they all have less than that, I suppose. So if you'll see here, if I select one that has less than three, that it just shows the region by itself. So it actually has some conditional logic in there. Okay. All right. So that's kind of a neat way to be able to interact with that and, and extend the capabilities of the tooltip uh, when it comes to the data visualization side here. Okay. All right, I'm gonna keep moving. I got a lot of things I wanna show you guys. Here's the next one I wanna show you. The next thing I wanna show you has to do with R again. I wanna show you some more R capabilities and R visuals now. And there's actually quite a bit you can do with R when it comes to Power BI. Let me uh, close this guy out and I'm gonna open up a partially completed example that we can work through. And in this partially completed example that we're going to use, bear with me while I open that here. In this partially completed example that we're going to use, we're actually gonna build out a map. And I wanna show you there's this neat place that you can go to actually find some pre-written R code. There's actually a couple places that you can, but this place is gonna be one that has uh, R code specific to Power BI and how people are using it in Power BI. And it's called the R Script Showcase. If you do a quick Bing or Google search for Power BI R Script Showcase, you'll find that as well. And um, what you'll find is if you go to that link or if you search for R Script Showcase Power BI, It'll bring you to a website where a lot of individuals have been developing R scripts to work against Power BI. Let me close out some of this stuff. And what you'll be able to see is a library of R scripts that have been created. Now this is pretty neat. It has a bunch of different things that you can use and leverage. And actually some of these are fairly new. I, I don't recall seeing that one yesterday. But it has a lot of things that you can use and leverage and bring into Power BI that leverage R. We learned about a couple of different ways we can use R already today, two different ways. This is the third way that we can use R, where we can actually use it on the data visualization side. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to actually walk through how you can use this sample, mapping with connecting lines. So if you had a data visualization that you wanted to create, say for example you work for a logistics company, and you wanted to show the line, the inter interconnecting line between two source and destination, you can do that with this uh, R visual. And uh, by the way, there's also a ton of R visuals that are available in the custom visuals gallery. I'll show you that in a few moments as well. But there's a lar lot of R integration when it comes to Power BI. So definitely something that's worth spending a little time researching. We're actually in the process of developing an R course here internally as well. So you'll be able to learn more with us if you'd like. And we've also done some webinars on using R and Power BI as well. But for this example, I have opened up a uh, partially set up data source. Basically all I have in this example is a data source that's been uh, imported for me. And what I wanna do in this example is I want to leverage an R visual, okay? Now you'll notice right here, inside your visualizations pane that there is an R script visual. 
And what that allows you to do is actually use the R scripting language to take the data that you have in your data set and uh, uh, visualize it using an R script, like the, the map I showed you a few moments ago. So here's how this works, and, and it's not that many lines of code, but here's how it works. You would select the R visual. It's going to go ahead and tell you that it's about to enable the R scripting interface down here in the bottom. Um, it does try and, they try and warn you about any possible security concerns. I'm not really sure how you could have some uh, infiltration here unless you got some code from someone and didn't really review it a whole lot. But I'm going to hit enable. And you can see down here in the bottom that it's first asking us for us to bring in all the values that we have, or really all the fields that we have, and bring them into the data, uh, the, uh, the, the visual here. So I'm going to start by resizing this a little bit. Let me make this a little larger and tell you what, I'm also going to bring in a quick bar chart just so that we can see something like the, uh, the year. Let's drag the year in here and see a count of how many um, how, how, how much travel we have by year. And so we can see 2015 has the second most travel, 2014 has the most travel, and 2013 has the least amount of travel. Now, in the R visual, we're going to use this as a filter, by the way. That's why I brought that in. In the R visual, we're going to plug in the code that we would have got from the R scripting library that we looked at a few moments ago. Uh, uh, so uh, Cordell asked the question, where did, where did I say that you can find this? You can find it from the R script gallery. So if you do a quick search for R script showcase, excuse me, R script showcase, Power BI, if you do a quick search for that, you'll find it. I'm also going to put it in reply to your chat and send it to all so everyone should be able to find that as well. All right, good deal. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the script that's in there, and I've already kind of taken it out of the download here as well, and we're going to use that R script. It's really not a whole lot of code. That's not it. Let me bring open the right one here. Here it is. So what you'll find in this example is just like we had in one of our previous examples, we need to install two libraries. There's two libraries that we need to install. We need to install the library for maps, and we need to install the library for Geosphere. And basically by installing these two packages, that gives us new code capabilities that we wouldn't have had previously available inside the R scripting language, because you can see right below that, the script immediately references those two libraries. So if you don't install the pack, you're not going to get uh, the packages, you're not going to get the capability of using this. It's pretty easy to install them. By the way, I've actually already shown you how to do that today. But just as a reminder of how you can do that, you can either launch the R, open R interface here, or you can launch R Studio. Either one works fine. You can do it at either one. And uh, it's pretty simple logic here. So James, you'll actually see it here in a moment. The simple logic that you'll use for this is you'll type in install.packages. Um, and, and tell you what, let me show you how this in R Studio because I really like how R Studio does it, and it has uh, IntelliSense that helps you out. But it's the same syntax. So let me close this out. Close this out. I like it in R Studio because it makes it simple. So here's what we'll do. So you're going to come into either R Studio or the other interface that we looked at a few moments ago. Either one will work, and you're going to type in install. Dot, and here's why I like R Studio. It's got IntelliSense. R Studio. Uh, sorry, install. Dot packages. And then the package that we want to install first is called map. Is it map or maps? Let me see. It is called maps. So we'll type maps, and that will install our first library. So we'll give that a few seconds to install. You can see it unzipping and installing it here. And then the second one that we want to install is called install.packages, and it's called geosphere. Okay, let me click away from that so you can actually see it. Once you install that second package, that gives us this new library of code that we can start using. It takes just a few seconds. In fact, it's already done. And now what we can do is we can start to use that code inside of the Power BI desktop. So we don't need this top part. We already used that. But what we do need is this area on the bottom. So I'm going to take everything I have here on the bottom. And by the way, you can get this script that I'm copying from a notepad document. It is inside of the uh, R script showcase I was showing you. Okay, So you can get it as well. All right, so I have it copied in my clipboard, but again, I haven't done what it's requesting. But down here in the bottom, it's telling me that I need to add fields into this values area to visualize them. So I'm going to go ahead and add all the fields that I have, just so I don't miss any. You can add extra ones even if you don't use them. And then I'm going to plug in the script that I have paste that I have copied right now, and I'm going to paste it into my R script visual here. Okay, it's the same script that I just showed you from my Notepad document, where it's referencing those two libraries for Maps and Geosphere. And then it's asking, it's requesting to have in those, the uh, columns from my data set. 
and then it's able to visualize those. You can see some information here around the colors that are being used. I'm not going to have time to dig too deep in this, uh, but you have things like latitude and longitude that it's reading in. It's reading specifically in here for columns called latitude from, longitude to, and then it's leveraging and using those. And then as soon as you hit the little play button or run script button up in the top right, let me make this a little smaller. Notice what happened behind the scenes here. So behind the scenes now, it's now created that R visual where I can now interact with it. And by the way, it does, these R visuals also work with uh, any other, uh, basically cross filtering applies. So if I select something in this chart here, you'll notice that it also works here. So as I select the different years, you'll notice that it is actually filtering and applying those filters with inside of the R script visual. You can also multi-select, all that stuff still works kind of subtle here because they're very thin lines, but it actually is refiltering or changing the way the data looks on the map based on what we select inside of my other chart. Okay, So that's kind of the basics of how you use the R script uh, showcase and also how you use the R script visual. Uh, now, I'm not sure if you're necessarily going to have uh, be writing R visuals from scratch unless you consider yourself a, an expert in R visuals as well. But um, uh, keep that in mind, you have the capability of doing uh, what we've shown here, where you can go kind of snag some script from someone else and then make it your own. All right. So that's the one. That, that's that one. The other way that you can use and leverage our scripts is within the Power BI Custom Visual Gallery. Okay. So I haven't had a ton, a ton of time to talk about the Custom Visual Gallery yet. But it's one of my favorite things. You'll know if you look at my blog, it's one of my favorite things because I have been blogging about it for almost a year. Uh, you can find if you go to devonightsql.com, I have blogged for 44 weeks in a row about all the different Power BI custom visuals that you have available to you. And I'm kind of going in order on the list and I'm showing you all the custom visuals that are available. And um, you can see there's quite a few. There's actually about uh, somewhere between 75 and 80 different custom visuals. And then there's another 10 or 15 R visuals that are available to you as well. And basically how this, these custom visuals work and the R visuals work is you would go to the custom visual gallery. And they're in the process, I mentioned this earlier today, they're in the process of moving that gallery from one place to another. But here's where you can find all of them right now. Uh, if you're watching this uh, live, then you would go to visuals.powerbi.com. And if you go to visuals.powerbi.com, that'll redirect you to the custom visual gallery, the one that is currently available, uh, that currently has all the visuals. And you can scroll through here and you can see all of these custom visuals that folks have developed. Some of these are Microsoft developed. Some of these are ones that were developed by individuals uh, outside of Microsoft. And in addition to the custom visuals, you also have this section here called R Powered Visuals. And underneath the R powered visuals, you have a several here that are devoted to integrating with R. Now, the good news about this R powered visuals is you don't have to know anything about R. Even though it's leveraging and using R in the back end, if you want to use one of these, you don't have to see any R code. This is the really, really, really cool part. Now, you still have to have the R engine installed on your machine, and you might have to install some of the packages. But the good news is the way that they've designed these is that they automatically install for you. So let me show you how this works. Uh, I have actually already downloaded ahead of time this decision tree one. And so let me show you how this one would work. If I wanted to show and take a look at this decision tree one, I would open up my partially completed example for this. Let me ditch this one. And yes, the, the David, you're right, the fish tank is one of the most, I, I can feel your sarcasm oozing out there, David, that the fish tank uh, uh, custom visual is one of the most useful. Um, all right, so I have this data set here that has in it, this is actually the uh, Titanic survival data. So who survived on the Titanic? You can see here, if I go to my data set, it has in here which men uh, versus women uh, were either survived or died in what uh, class they were. Were they in th third class passenger, uh, first class passenger, whatever. And so what the R visual allows me to do is if I were to go import my R visual for decision tree, I can see what factors led to someone uh, uh, either surviving or not surviving the uh, Titanic uh, catastrophe. So if I went to go import a custom visual here, I would select the R visual, and this R visual is a decision tree one that I'm using. This is the same one that you would find right here underneath the visuals gallery. And by the way, I told you that Microsoft is in the process of moving these. They're moving them to the Office Store. So I would go to store.office.com, find underneath Power BI, 
And underneath Power BI, they have a good portion of the visuals here. Here's the decision tree one. They're working on moving the rest of them here. They're not all here yet, but they're, they're, they're working on it. They have, let's see, how many total? They have about 45 of them over here now. They just haven't moved them all over yet. All right, so the... Where were we? We were talking about using this R visual. I'm going to select the decision tree visual here. Hit open. Hit OK. You can now see the decision tree visual made available here. And this is pretty neat how it works. If you've ever actually worked with anything like data, data mining, machine learning, you're probably familiar with what decision tree is. Basically, it shows you a visual representation of the path at how something came to a certain decision. So how did something come to a point where someone, in this case, either survive or die, during this, the during Titanic. So I could do something like this. You'll see there's two fields. There's no R I have to write here at all. This is the cool part. But you'll see there's two fields that I need to populate. There's a target variable and there's an input variable. And basically the target variable is what I'm trying to predict. So I'm trying to predict survival. So I'll drop survived in here. And then for the input variables, I'll pass in what are the variables, what are some of the things I want to pass in to determine whether or not someone actually uh, actually did survive or not. So I would pass in age, gender, uh, passenger class, and with all these things, you can see it builds out this decision tree for me. And let me make this full screen so you can actually see it. But it shows me we're looking at 100% of a representation of our audience here. It splits based on their gender. So uh, everyone that was male comes down the left path. Everyone that was female comes, that basically anyone that was not male, comes down the right path. And I can see that uh, the survival rate between the two here you can also uh, add some filtering to this if you wanted to. So say, for example, I wanted to add in something like a slicer. Oop, didn't want to do that. Let's add a slicer in this way, and I can add in something like gender here. And then I can analyze men versus female here and kind of compare and see how they uh, uh, work against each other. So uh, it's an interesting way, and, and yes, uh, James, there is a reference to Celine Dion in here. You can see whether or not she made the, <laughs> if she made the survival list. So it's an interesting way, though, however, to see the ways that you can actually get into and, and start to analyze some of the capabilities here within the R scripting language, okay? Now, again, in this case, I didn't have to write any R. It all kind of built it out for me on its own. Now, the other thing that's really, really cool that I want to show you is there's another way that you can also have some advanced analytic integration without you necessarily having to write R. And you can do things like forecasting, you can also do things like clustering, and it doesn't require that you write any scripting at all, and it's built in. And so that's really probably where we'll wrap up because we're running out of time here. And uh, uh, yeah, I saw someone um, bring up, uh, Charles, that we actually uh, did, did cover, or did skip some of the sections of the data modeling section, uh, but, we do have a, a previous webinar where I did cover those. So if you look for Advanced Power BI in a previous webinar, I did get to cover them there. Uh, I, I thought I'm going to try and skip to some of the stuff I didn't get to cover uh, because it was only a one-hour webinar previously. All right. So I'm getting dry mouth here, guys. I've been talking. Uh, so here's what we're going to do for this last one. We're going to open up a partially completed example for this one as well. And I want to show you some of the advanced analytic capabilities that are built into Power BI but do not require you to write any coding. You don't have to download a custom visual. You don't have to do really anything extra to, to, to use this. And in this example, what we're going to look at is the baseball data that we started off with. So you remember we started off uh, pretty early on. Our very first R example, actually, for that matter, was we pulled in some, data, some baseball data. And we were looking at all these different baseball franchises and their performance over time. And we were also looking at things like home runs and how home runs have increased over time. And so this is a completed version of what we built out a little bit of before. And so what I'd like to do is show you how you can actually leverage and use some of the advanced analytics capabilities that are built into Power BI to do things like forecasting and also to do things like clustering. So the first example I want to show you is around forecasting. Forecasting capabilities are built into certain visuals. Uh, more specifically, they're built into line charts. And so if I select the line chart here that you see, the line chart has the ability to go underneath this special section that we've been avoiding thus far called analytics. So if you select a chart, you should be able to go over to where it says analytics, and you have some new capabilities to be able to enhance what you're doing in this particular visual. So if I select the line chart, go to in, uh, analytics, you'll see there's a ton of different things that you can add here. You can add in a trend line if you wanted to, so I can kind of see a trend line, how we've been trending over time. That's kind of nice. 
You can add in uh, things like a, a min or max or average uh, percentile line in here. You can add quite a few things if you'd like. But what I'd really like to add is the capability to do some forecasting. I want to do predictions. I not only want to see where we've been as far as home runs in the past, all the way through 2016, I want to see where we're going in the future. Are we really going to increase in home runs over time even more than we already are? As we can see an obvious trend in Major League Baseball over time where home runs are increasing. Obviously, there's more teams here. There's more players hitting, so that's going to happen. But I want to see where we're going in the future. You know, it looked like we had a major peak in the year 2000, and then we started to go down some, and then 2016, we went back up. So where is the future? What's the future out, uh, outlook for us as far as home runs is concerned? And so to do that, we're going to select the line chart, we're going to go under the analytics pane, and we're going to go down to forecast. You can add in a forecast line here, so I'll hit add. And by the way, you can name this line here as well if you wanted to, so you can give it some kind of a name. But right now, let me before you look over here, let me focus your attention in this area. You can actually configure this forecast line. So right now, it's configured to be based off of years. So right now, it's trying to predict 10 years into the future. If I had actually used a true date time value or a date value, it would also have the ability to select in the drop-down box here, and you can tell it you want to go 10 months in the future, 10 days in the future. But because I just used year without a date, it's just uh, there's, there's no date in here. It's just rolled up to a year level. It's showing uh, 10 points into the future. And so, of course, I can do, I can change it. So let's say I only want to look five years into the future. I can do that and hit apply, and it adjusts it so that I can see just a prediction into the next five years. You can also kind of do this in the focus mode so you can see it a little bit better, and you can see what the prediction looks like here. One of the things that's also kind of interesting is you can tell it a certain number of data points that you want to ignore. So let's say, for example, 2016, we had a peak, and it was really an abnormal year. We wouldn't expect to see... Uh, 2016 had that number of home runs, you can actually tell it that you want to ignore the last year. So I can tell it right here that I want to ignore one point backwards. So I want to ignore the last year's worth of data here and hit apply. And you'll see what it'll do is it'll actually ignore that one year. You can see that year kind of keeps going, but our predictions ignore it. And we base, we, we base our prediction based off of everything except for 2016. It's also an interesting way to test how accurate your predictions are. So let's say, for example, I told it to ignore the last, uh, let's say I want to predict 15 years in the future and I want to ignore the last 10 years. Hit apply on that, and you'll notice here, here's kind of my cone of prediction. If you've uh, watched the Weather Channel and the, the, the cone of uh, hurricane forecast, I kind of have a cone of prediction here where my cone is showing me what it's actually predicting is the line. Uh, and then we have kind of an upper bound. So the upper bound you can see on the tooltip in a lower bound, and it looks like in some cases it actually went outside of the lower bound. In 2014, that was an abnormally low year for home runs, at least based on the last 15 years or the last 10 years, I should say. So it's an interesting way to be able to use and built-in advanced analytics capabilities all in that analytics pane. That's one way to do it. And we're running out of time, so, but I do want to show you one more. So let me actually take this back, hit apply. There we go. All right, so the last one I want to show you is I'm going to create a new report. This is actually a fairly new feature. Hey, look, Power BI new updates here. Um, the last feature I want to show you has to do with the, uh, the scatter chart. And the scatter chart, this is a, a uh, general, generally available feature now. It's in GA. And what this basically is is I'm going to show you how you can do clustering. And this is going to end up being a kind of cool way to end, I think, And that we're going to take values that we have for each of our baseball uh, teams, and we're going to build out this uh, scatter chart for them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by uh, bringing in the, uh, I'll tell you what, first let's filter down to one year just so it's not too complex to end here. Excuse me, I'm going to filter this to just 2016. Let's make that equals 2016. All right, so we're filtered down to one year. And then what I would like to bring in here is I want to bring in the franchise. Franchise ID, I think it's called, right here. And I'm going to drop that into, oop, I selected wrong. Uh, I'm going to drop that into uh, the detail section. And then I'm going to bring in ERA, earn run average, into the X axis. I'm going to bring in the number of wins into the Y axis. So we've been doing a lot of analysis around hitting. I now want to do some analysis around pitching. 
And so what we can see here, and again, it's kind of tiny here, but we'll talk through it. What we can see here is an analysis that's showing us the, the, each, each dot represents a franchise. This is for last year. But those dots are showing the earn run average. So that's basically pitching. The higher the number is actually bad if you're not a big baseball fan. So the higher the ERA the bad is bad, that means the pitchers are giving up a lot of runs. And then the total number of wins is showing vertically here. So horizontally, I have how many runs each uh, the teams are giving up on average. And then uh, the wins uh, going vertically here. And so what I can see here is it looks like, as you might guess, the lower the ERA, the more wins you have. So the better your pitchers, the, the fewer runs they give up, the more wins you have. And you can see here that it looks like, go figure, the world champion Chicago Cubs, I'm not a fan, but that's okay if you are, uh, the world champion Chicago Cubs had the lowest ERA and they also had the most wins. I can see here who had the highest or uh, let's see, the, low, the lowest number of wins. So the fewest wins was the Minnesota Twins and they also had one of the highest ERA. They had over five ERA. That's pretty bad. Uh, looks like uh, Arizona I was right there with them. The Diamondbacks are right there with them. I'm, I'm a Braves fan, by the way. We're, we're kind of, we're, we're on this lower side of the pack. We're not doing so hot right now. But here's what I can do with this when, from a Power BI perspective is I can take this data that we're looking at here and I can actually group these into clusters using a, an algorithm, a clustering algorithm to bring these and group these values together. I can do that by coming up to the ellipses in the top right hand side of the chart. So you'll see these little ellipses right here. If I select those ellipses and hit automatically find clusters, Notice what happens here. When I hit automatically find clusters, it's going to pop open this new dialog box here for me where I can create clusters. Tell you what, I'm going to let it automatically find clusters on its own, and then I'm going to show you how you can adjust this. So I'll hit OK. It's going to automatically create some clusters for me here. It actually does create some things in the data modeling side as well. But notice what happened. It automatically created five different clusters. Looks like the Chicago Cubs are all by themselves here in the top left. Looks like I have a cluster uh, showing up here where those are kind of my moderate ones. They're not quite the best. Chicago Cubs are the best here. And uh, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of baseball chatter now. Oh, great. Um, and then uh, we have kind of the second cluster here. Really, it's called cluster four. Cluster two, three is my red ones. Cluster two is this kind of black, and then we got a gray one here. But here's what we can do. We can actually adjust these clusters because what happens when you tell it to automatically create clusters is it also creates a new column inside your data model. So check this out. If I go over to my data, uh, my field list, my uh, field list over here, you can see that it created a new field over here that's grouped. That's what that little icon is, is it actually groups some of these things together. And so what I can do is I can select that, right click on it, and I can tell it that I want to edit the cluster that we created. Okay, so if I hit edit cluster, I can tell it now, uh, well, do I want to rename, maybe I want to change this to, instead of having five clusters, maybe have four, or maybe three, or whatever I want. So maybe I can make this into clusters of four instead of five, and then hit OK, and you'll notice that actually automatically adjusts itself. That probably actually looks a lot better now. So I can see, again, the Cubs are all by themselves, but then the other uh, clusters are kind of the, the, the pretty good teams. The doing all right teams, and then the bottom of the barrel over here. That's probably my, my, my lonesome Braves over here. So here's, here's another thing I can do. I can also name the clusters. If I went back and I right-clicked and said I want to edit the clusters, I can rename these if I wanted to. So I can come over here and say, well, let's call this the World Champs. And then I can name these maybe Playoff Teams. And then maybe I call these playoff contenders. Sorry, it's three hours of talking. I'm losing my spelling here. Bear with me. I'm just going to abbreviate. <laughs> no, I'm going to spell it right. How about that? How playoff contenders. There we go. And then my last one will be, I'm sorry, you're no good. All right, so I've got my groupings here. I hit OK. It's now renamed those groupings up here. And, of course, I can analyze them here. It does actually allow me to – oh, look at this. I had an interesting – oh, oh, I made a mistake here with the order that I did them. So I should have looked more carefully at the grouping in here. You can see here that I should have actually renamed those a little bit better because I have the I'm sorry, you're no good is actually the second cluster, whereas it should have been this one way down here. So I got the names mixed up, but you get the idea. You can actually rename those clusters there to something other than cluster one, two, three, four.
okay? So we are certainly out of time. Um, I am going to tell you what, because you guys have had such a, a, a large amount of questions, I will uh, spend this week trying to filter through these questions. They are sent to me from our marketing team. Uh, I will do one last reminder here. I want to thank you guys for attending, and I want to remind you one last time that we do have that Power BI Pack special offer that you can partake in if you'd like. That Power BI Pack you can find uh, on our website if you go to pragmaticworks.com and our on-demand training. You'll find the Power BI Pack that includes five courses. Before attending today, you get 20% 20, 20 off uh, those courses and just by using the shopping cart and typing in the promo code Power BI Pack. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I need some water, but I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, webinar today and um, look forward to us doing some more of these. We actually, just to give you a, a heads up, we do have some more Power BI uh, webinars coming up. We have a Power BI security webinar coming up as well as an advanced DAX uh, web, one hour webinar uh, coming up. Those are both one hour ones. We usually try and do these three hour ones about once a quarter. We do hope you guys enjoy them and it gives you a good taste of what our training is like and you'll be able to uh, see that as well if you purchase from us. I do recommend if you have any extra questions, go ahead and plug them into the chat window and I'll try and make sure I can address them via a blog, a follow-up of some kind.